And it's because of them <laughs> I'll never find the right temperature. Oh no! <laughs> doomed, doomed. Which, to which does mean, of course, yes, that the oh. eventually half of my half of my zoo will die. Yeah. But in the meantime, I can just start uh. myself with the big damn cast. Hi, everybody. I'm Hi. Christopher. Think of the penguins, Johnson. And I'm wearing a mask. Are you? What's it? Oh, just like, <laughs> that's, that's your name now. Name. Right? That's just my name. Um, that's my name now. Uh, don't wear it, but do wear it. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, welcome to Big Dove Cast. Nerdy news, geeky gossip. Uh, whatever's happening in the world. What do we feel like fucking talking about? Uh, here there be bad language, but there also be jollity. So if you don't mind swears, then fucking pull up a seat and sit down, <laughs> you twat. Pull up um, a seat, you fucker. Pull up a seat, you dirty fucker. Now, uh, there's little bits of pop culture news to talk about this week. There's not a great deal uh, that isn't just incredibly depressing, like theatres going into um, administration. <sighs> yeah, and shopping centres going into administration, so places where you can buy entertainment are about to become... Harder to get to, and Bezos is going to become the richest bastard on the planet as a result. How? How <laughs> can the Trafford Centre, yep. with the yep. rents it charges, be going into administration? When was the When was the last time you went in there? As a as a as a former employee of that building, I can I can imagine. Well, other business as little as possible. <laughs> you go in there as little as possible. I but do try and avoid last- it. The last time I went was uh, sometime in February, and it was like no, no bugger. It might have no, been no, no bugger. So many closed shops. It might have been before so, Christmas, you know. Could have been, but there's so many shops that just weren't, weren't. I don't mean like you know pandemic era. I mean pre that. Oh, they, they're just empty units. Yeah, yeah. Like Hamleys went. for rent. Hamleys, Hamleys, and do you know why? Because it was the only thing in the Trafford Centre's main centre for kids. Yeah. It was the only thing for kids in there. Yeah. Um, after the entertainment things got rid, like game became tiny, HMV became tiny. Well, no no crash, no play park, no McDonald's outside of the food court. You and say the that, Lego Land but... and Sea Life stuff are in a completely separate building across the road. So you say that, but game does have that upstairs gaming area. Yeah, but you can, like... have you ever tried to get in there and find a controller that isn't covered in what can only be described as fingerprint semen? Well, no, but I'm not a child who's been dragged to the Trafford Centre by his parents all day, so I, d- I just go home and play video games if I want to, you know what I mean? That's true. What have you been playing this week, Fair Squire? With your big holes uh, and your no, large I've been pl- tendrils? I've been playing a little bit of The Last of Us on stream. I've been, yeah, um, I've been watching and feeling depressed. Just Yeah, <laughs> I know, great. right? I've been uh, nibbling at the edges of the of the new Pokemon DLC, still. Um, yarb, and enjoying yarb. that. Uh, enjoying my time on the Isle of Armour. But mostly I've been painting little plastic men. I've seen. Uh, and what are those men's men. names and how much do they charge you? Uh, how much do you charge them for painting? <laughs> well, yeah, you, first been, off you've is been... David. <laughs> he's he very generous likes, with his time. He likes a good thick coat. Yeah, he's determined that you get even the, the crook of the knee and the elbow. He will not settle for little mm. pale smudges. Um, no, it, been, it, it, it also is... Just... What? You've been licking your 40Ks and I've your Lord of the Rings. I've been licking my 40Ks. Boys. Uh, I'm not standing on the Lord of the Rings, guys, yet. I've got... So basically, my plan is I've got... Um, with, like, the backlog of stuff that I had from before I stopped playing, uh, and, like, the backlog of unpainted, in some cases, unassembled models. Uh, unpainted along boys with and goyles. Unpainted boys and ghouls. Uh, I've got about... Oh, yeah, Google's playing up again. Um, I've got about <laughs> 500 points worth of Blood Angels and 500 points worth of Orcs. So that's, you know, two small armies that you can have a quick game with. I've just got to everything, pay a few. Everything you just said was erotically charged, whether you meant oh, yeah. it to be or not. I know, so you know. I'm, I'm, I'm a little hard right now. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> so I've got... So I'm working on finishing the last bits of those first. So I've got two 40k armies because... 
Ninth edition comes out on the 25th of July. Um, although I won't be getting it for a while because it's going to be fucking expensive. <laughs> it's, um, a new, it's a new product. Yeah, it's, it's going to be a shout out for right away. It's going to be a lot of money. I'm definitely not getting that box, that's for sure. Cause fuck me. Um, and then uh, I've got some Lord of the Rings stuff to cross off my backlog, but I've already got plenty of Lord of the Rings stuff painted that I can play with as is, but I just want to crack in that backlog. But I, I have such a backlog of miniatures to paint. Yeah. From before I dropped out of the hobby that I shouldn't really need to buy any new models this side of Christmas. What I love is you're already getting back into it like it were an old pair of socks because you just called it the hobby. The hobby. Yeah. The Get hobby back into the horse. Hobby. But Get yeah, and so the over the last over the last week I've painted 15 Space Marines with another five half done. So, you know, that's not bad. You've painted 15 tiny men. I've painted 15 tiny men. Are what about you? What have you been playing this week, Cocker? Uh, outside of streaming hours, I've started to set aside time to game stuff outside of streaming. Uh, there are two games I've been playing. Um, started Kingdom Hearts 3 yesterday. Oh! Or as it should really be titled, Kingdom Hearts Part 72. <laughs> the, the closest game I can compare it to is Metal Gear Solid 4, Guns of the Patriots. In what way? Because uh, if it's your first one, yep. you'll be lost completely on the Fair. plot. Fair. And the game pulls no punches on going, no, 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 do the required reading. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and also, just like... In, <laughs> we released just all like, those compilations... <laughs> Go and just buy like, them. Just like MGS4, it's also 95% cutscenes. Yeah, okay, fair, fair. I've played, I've played a total of 4 hours and 42 minutes mm-hmm. since I started. But how much have you I, actually played? About 30 minutes of that has been gameplay. <laughs> Jesus I'm Christ. I'm not even kidding. And it's not fun cutscenes either. No. It's, 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 you know, exposition dumps. Uh, it's a bunch of with ridiculous hair in robes going, but you won't know the quality of your heart <laughs> if you haven't heard the nobody. And he's just like, please because tell me Billy Zane's still voicing Anson. Uh, or is I can't Anson not tell. Anson and Zayanot, because he's two people now. Um, well, but he's also a spin I'm off wrong, from the bald dude as well. It. I don't think Kingdom Hearts knows much about Kingdom Hearts, so go for it. Like, fair play. But isn't isn't Zehanor like an evil dude who is possessing Ansem and is like possessing people now or something? Yeah, but he's also like another person or something. It, oh, and, okay, cool. And and it's it's something to do with like the reason why Sora was also Roxas, which went right. So long story short, for people who have no fucking clue what we're talking about. Don't you worry, you literally can't make do the story of Kingdom Hearts short. Yeah, they're Can't different world. They're, they're different worlds, and this evil shadow stuff starts appearing. And and a uh, little boy called Sora is the chosen one who has to go out and basically defeat the darkness and and unlock unlock the light on each world with his blade shaped like a key. And he's joined by two other travelers from from another world, uh, Donald and Goofy. Yes, that Donald and Goofy, because the other worlds are Final Fantasy and Disney like worlds. And it's you know it's it's a dead simple fetch quest. The original game. Travel here, finish that story mission. Travel here, finish that story mission. Travel here, finish that story mission. Oh, the baddie was really the person whose journal you've been collecting along the way. F- defeat him in a ridiculously complicated, tough as butt fuck boss battle, and that's the end of the game. And, oh, there's something out there. We're going to venture out and save the day again. Great. Sure. Whatever. I'm playing number two. What's that? I have no idea why this is the setting all of a sudden. You mean you didn't play the Game Boy Advance game? Wait, what? What? Considering the first game, first two games were just PlayStation titles as well. They were just yes. PlayStation titles. Yes. So, uh, oh my God. So it's like, there's a so technically the order is like a PlayStation game. PlayStation 2 game, then a Game Boy Advance game, yes. then a PlayStation 2 game, but then after that there's like a mobile game set during the period between the two PlayStation titles, which you can't get anymore, but you can watch brand new, <sighs> brand new uh, newly animated cutscene adaptation of on one of the re-releases. Is that recoded? Yes, I think. Uh, then there's a Game Boy Advance one, which is like 379 over two days, which I've got, which is about... No, because Game Boy Advance is Chain of Memories. Oh, sorry, DS, that's the one, yeah. So, uh, DS, sorry. Uh, And that's set um, uh, just before Kingdom Hearts 2. 
uh, and then there's a PSP title which you like can't get anymore, so they've sort of redone it so you can just watch it as cutscenes on the remasters. And the Game Boy Advance game you can't obviously get anymore unless you can track it down. I've so, got a copy. So it's been well, it's been redone on the remaster re-release of one as a card game, but with cutscenes like made. So the whole game is playable, but it's a trading card battle game instead. No, of that's levels. what it is on the Game Boy. Is that what it is on the Game Boy too? So, yeah, yeah. so it's so, so all, it is that it, you move around in yeah pseudo like isometric pseudo three D space and you jump. Okay, but all so your attacks pl- are decided by the deck and the order you draw your cards in. Flaming hell. So okay, it's about so deck building basically. Oh Jesus! So there's that, and then there's yeah. um. I don't think it's very good. I've just, there's I've just a liked title it released on PlayStation two or three in Japan only that was like a really short <laughs> game or something like that that never got a got a Western release. Nothing and that's came now out sort of a thing. And then there is a a prequel, a prequel to <sighs> number Jesus three Christ. that is set in the like distant past that finally follows up on the the secret good ending post credits cutscene from the first one and that's essentially it was a tech demo for the third one so it's like a seven hour campaign that's basically there to go this is what the third one's going to play like guys but it also has fuck all to do with it and then on that separate release which is called kingdom hearts 2.8 um that has got uh, uh, other adaptations of like a, a mobile game or some shit on there and things and then there's a cinematic that's just on that like it's, it's just basically like an hour long film that you just watch is like a and after you've played this here's a bridge that's going to set you up for number three and like, okay and then you play number three holy effing shit and the reason it's upsetting is because there'll be people who'll just dive into the series because they saw the trailer and they went oh my god you can you can play a toy story level Holy shit, you can hang out with Elsa and Anna? I mean, Frozen? Oh, like, they'll see the trailer and they'll to, go... Though? Do you want to? Well, yeah, but you'll see the... Tra- that was the original appeal of the first one, wasn't it? Back in, like, the early 2000s. You saw the trailer or any images for it. You went, wait, you get to play on Disney World like, with Disney characters? Sign you know what Square the Enix did? Up, they fucking Square Enix did, is what they, they did. Square Enix did. They Tomb Raided and Upcoming Avengers did. They made it too, too dense and too padded and... Oh, God. I yeah, I didn't, I didn't get There's, all the way through two. I, I just couldn't do it. It's a pacing thing. There's definitely some lost in translation stuff to do with the countries of development for the game because it's it's just storytelling is different. Pacing is different in certain places for their media. And, you know, uh, Kingdom Hearts, because Square Enix, I think we talked about this before, they're like a French company, aren't they? But something like that. But, but Japan is where Kingdom Hearts originated and like the copyright and Final Fantasy and all that stuff came from. No, Kingdom Hearts is not Japanese developed. Oh, it's Japanese. Okay. Is yep, it Crystal yeah. Dynamics from France or somewhere? I can't remember. It's one of the yeah, people involved so. in it from somewhere yeah, else. Yeah, uh, no, um, um, no. Um, um, that's the title of the Kingdom fifth game. Kingdom Hearts comes out of Square, so- Square Enix's internal studios. Okay, Japan, so, so so it's completely JRPG. and JRPGs, Some of the spin-offs might have been farmed out with the developers, but... Maybe. The main, JRP- the main series. JRPGs can be magical, batshit crazy, wonderful fun games and others can just be really long and drawn out especially in the cutscenes and the dialogue and you're just like Argh. it's not really a jrpg Argh. though no well yeah not in the strictest sense. it's like if a jrpg gave up and decided to become a hack and slash yeah kind of it, it's but but it's got the amount of lore and the amount of like just text and of an RPG, you know what, like when it teaches you basic moves, yeah, you come yeah. up across eighteen screens of instructions that basically boil down to just mash triangle when it goes green. Just that, that's what it boils. Down, honestly, that's what it boils down to. Just hit triangle when it goes green. Um, the All last right. thing I did, the last thing I did was go back to Twilight Town, the location from the start of the second game and the location from the DS game, and uh, like the last thing I did was I found Remy. The rat from Ratatouille in oh. the forest, and it helped him collect fruit. And now he's come back into Twilight Town, and he's teamed up with Uncle Scrooge, who's now running a restaurant, which is basically a second synthesizing place for you to get potions and and boosts from the food you find while you're out and about, like fruits and things like that. It's like, okay, I've had worse offers. Uh, this is fine, I guess, but. Yeah. 
what what is happening <laughs> I, uh, why spaceship chip and dell uh, um no disassemble stephanie um but the other thing i've been playing relentlessly and getting a bit more of a solid kick out of really is doctor who 13 <laughs> Which is you remember the game twenty forty eight the tile game that was online yeah, where you it's a, like one and one and you of threes. Can... Yeah. Yes. Right. Well, Do- <laughs> Doctor Who has first, now everybody. Doctor Who has now ripped off twenty forty eight. <laughs> yeah. No, I've seen. Um, this is why Hartnell's been popping up on Twitter everywhere, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, which is hilarious for two reasons. One, there was already a Doctor Who version of this game back when the twenty forty eight site was up and people were like coding their own versions of it. Like yeah. there were Doctor Who versions, but obviously this is the most up to date one you can now get. It's got fourteen, uh, thirteen levels to get through, thirteen levels of calculation because you have to get through the first thirteen incarnations of the Doctor, including John Hurt, and you win when you create a Jodie Whittaker. So you have to basically combine two Capaldis to win, and it's a tile sliding game, and it's one of those where you're like, oh, this is pretty simple, and then five minutes in, you're like, Jesus Christ, I'm actually having to really think like four moves ahead to make this work now. Oh my god. I love it. I've played versions of it for years. Uh, the Doctor Who TV, uh, BBC Studios, like, own spin-off website from Doctor Who uh, has released a version, and it's blown everyone's mind. But it's also funny, because Five Who fans did a video about this years ago. <laughs> years ago. Yeah, yeah. And it's weird to see people going like, oh my god, I'm getting so annoyed to see William Hartnell's face. And it's like, yeah, do you remember that was the joke premise of one of Billy Tracy's videos? <laughs> and people people hated Billy for the longest time because they never actually watched the video. They just read the title Why William Hartnell is the Worst Doctor and immediately assumed that he hated uh, Classic Who. Why do you hate like, William Hartnell? And now everyone's making uh, jokes about like, God damn it, I hate seeing his fucking face. And it's like, okay. Okay, guys. Okay. 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 Welcome. Well, I think we all need to sort of catch up with, with Billy. Little as a, Billy's as a, eyes as a, as a planet. We just need to catch up with him. Well, he and uh, some of my five who fans alumni have been a little busy the last couple of week. Um, yeah, putting, putting together the relaunch, the long-awaited relaunch of Aimless Wanderings. Uh, I saw this on the space. Twitters. Yeah, I've worked. I've worked on one of them so far for them. Uh, I don't know. I don't know what I'm allowed to say. Um, it's best not to say anything then. Yeah, just I. I I have narrated an upcoming release is all I'll say. Um, But yeah, the the parody Doctor Who audio uh, project is back with a loose as and when we release them schedule, which we've made a very clear point from the start of this announcement of saying they're out when they're out. Like nobody be a prick and be like, when's it coming out? When's it coming out? They're out when they're out. It's done when it's done. Yeah, and the announcement kicks off, though, with, with the first one to be brought out, a new Fruit Pastel audio starring uh, lovely Benji LaBonge, Benji Clifford himself. So the Fruit Pastel Doctor is back first, and uh, there are new adventures planned for all of the comedy incarnations of the Doctor from uh, Aimless Wanderings. So if you want to listen to it, folks, uh, just search Aimless Wanderings in time and space on Google, and there'll be a podcast provider with them all, I'm sure. I listen to them on Apple Podcasts, so there you go. Comcarnations. Yeah. What in tarnations? Um, uh, there's tiny bits of news, I guess, but this week yeah. we also want to catch up on emails. Um, just before we went live, a couple of hours before we went live, uh, Ray Fisher, uh, Broadway and stage actor, uh, who is sort of most notable worldwide for playing Cyborg in Justice League, who yes. absolutely, absolutely deserved better because he was very underused in the cut of it, and we know there was a lot on the cutting room floor, apparently. Yeah. Um, and the characterization he was given was basically just, I think you should move now. I think uh, you should move. That, you should stand aside. <laughs> and that, that line wasn't even in the film as well. It was only in the trailers. He wasn't really um, given any direction. He was just given blocking. Yeah, just stand over there a bit, Ray. Uh, yeah. Has put out, just randomly stuck out a tweet saying that, yeah. um, that uh, Joss Whedon was absolutely horrible to cast and crew alike and really nasty uh, on the during the reshoots for Justice League. Of course, Justice League was a Zack Snyder movie. Tragedy hits the family, Zack Snyder steps back. Instead of Paul halting the production for months on end, Warner Brothers make the decision to halt it temporarily and then bring in Joss Whedon, who they were talking to about making a Batgirl movie at the time, to come in and finish off the reshoots and, and do some tweaks and changes because the studio were apparently unhappy with whatever the cut was at that point in terms of how it was going in the dailies and then the rough cut. Um, yeah, I've got so, a variety of that cut up now. So once Snyder left, they were like, right, 
here's your, we want more of this, we want more of that, we want more of this. You're the guy who did Avengers Assemble, so you, you know, you, you, we know you can make this work. And Joss didn't make it work. And it's a terrible movie, but it's not a terrible movie because of Joss Whedon. However, it seems that uh, it was a terrible time making the movie because of Joss Whedon, according to Ray Fisher, who mm. also calls out uh, then head of like the filmmaking stuff, Jeff Johns. Yes. Um, saying that he allowed a lot of this to go unchecked. Uh, and also says, was it uh, accountability is greater it's than... Greater than entertainment. Um, entertainment yeah. yeah and it, it's like it makes you wonder why now why now why three years after doing these reshoots does ray fisher decide he wants to say something about this um what is there to Couldn't gain now but i wonder if Zack snyder has come around to a lot of the artists involved because obviously he's getting a lot of the key players for justice league back in some capacity for the upcoming hbo max Zack snyder's justice league or based on the font used for the promo Zack snyder's Justice League, um, the, Justice League, the, Zack Snyder. Yeah, the these a, the a Zack Snyder cut, unquote, of the movie Justice League that's going to be coming to HBO Max next year. Um, it makes you wonder whether or not because a lot of the actors have been really supportive of Zack Snyder in recent weeks and in recent months. We talked last year about how Gal Gadot and Ben Affleck both randomly tweeted out released the Snyder cut on the same day, and it was like either they're all playing part of a prank or there's some support group going on here. Mm. Uh, Obviously, if Joss Whedon was abusing people on set and being nasty, then what a twat. And he does have, he does have a history of being an arsehole. He has form. He has form. Yeah. Um, On his sets. Various things. But, yes, there has been this weird pre-existing thing with the DCEU movies where they have been slagging off anything that is connected to Marvel. There's been like a big MCU pushback. Uh, Most notably during the press for Batman v Superman, early Justice League production and Suicide Squad, there was a lot of the directors and the actors like, you know, wearing... I mean, Christ's sake, some of them were wearing T-shirts that said, um, fuck Marvel. They were apparently given out as like a joke joke gift at a party. But yeah. They were pictured in them. Uh, David Ayer said, fuck Marvel at the Suicide Squad premiere. It's like, this is petty and weird. And part of me's like, if Joss Whedon Whedon was horrible on set, and there's definitely a track record for it, then dude needs to be, you know, bollocked for this, or at least own up to it and apologize. Um, But part of me's like, are they all kind of like allying Snyder in a way to sort of be like, yeah, yeah, Marvel boy. Coming in here and ruining the movie that Zack wanted to make? Piss off! We don't like you. It's very, very strange. Add to that the fact that the Marvel vitriol from the hardcore DCEU fandom seems to be so odd. Um, like, in the past, they, they, they support all the movies except the two with women leads and the one aimed at kids. Like, Wonder Woman, Birds of Prey, and um, uh, Shazam got basically no support from the DCEU yeah, uh, Snyder fandom, as it were, who love basically the three Zack Snyder movies and, uh, or, or two Zack Snyder movies and the one they've not seen yet, and um, the David Ayer film Suicide Squad, but they didn't go out and see Birds of Prey. Uh, they barely barely have talked about Shazam prior to this, and they barely bring up Wonder Woman if ever. Um, so yeah. that's really weird. Uh, at the time when Shazam was coming out, there was speculation that there was less excitement from the DCEU online fandom because Shazam starred Zachary Levi, whose previous superhero franchise project was a Thor movie. Because uh, I remember that at the time, being thinking like, oh, he's a fucking Marvel boy, just coming over here. And it's like, what do you... He's an actor playing a role. Yeah. What? What is wrong with you? It's just fucking but tribalism, it's... man. It's silly. But that's got even weirder in the past week. There's a fan cut coming out online of Shazam. A fan who's a big, uh, like, big proponent of the 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 release of the Snyder Cut movement that has now obviously decided it needs oh, to find something else to be that we need about. in this day and age. Fucking oh, release no. the Snyder Cut. Fuck off! And those people it's not get a movement. pissed off. And those people get pissed off. The movement you, is a bunch you... of entitled whiny shit. And those people get pissed off when you talk about actual stuff that matters as well. Yeah. It's just ridiculous. When we talk about um, feminism, when we talk about Black Lives Matter, when you talk about trans rights, they're just like, oh, but Batman's so cool. It doesn't fucking matter how cool Batman is. 
Fuck off with your Batmans. <laughs> take your Batman. Fuck off. All right? I'm saying take you see sw- you now. Take your sweaty rubber gorilla stuffed into a suit Batman and fuck off. Um... They 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 are they're getting behind a, a weird kind of vibe at the minute that Shazam was a mistake and it was childish and it was an insult to what Snyder had set up. So this <laughs> fan edit, I know this fan edit is happening where it's going to be quote removing some of the humor. It's been rescored by a fan to have a darker sound. Scenes have been removed. A couple of deleted scenes have been put back in. A Suicide Squad post credit scene has been added to it. What? I know. I have no idea. What? Um, I know, right? And um, they've said they've put Cavill in it where he belongs. So what have they edited that final shot? <laughs> yeah, to have still have fucking padded scanned that shot. And fucking despite, despite stuck the fact- his face on there. <laughs> mild spoilers for Shazam, folks. Mild spoilers for Shazam. I mean, watch it. It's great. But mild spoilers for Shazam. At the very end, um, <laughs> Shazam introduces his, his uh, foster brother, uh, Freddy, to Superman. And you just see, you see like Superman coming from an over the shoulder shot. He approaches the table, like you sort of see him from the, from like the waist up at the school table. Yeah. And Freddy goes like, holy shit. And then it cuts it's, to the credits and it's yeah, like. It's, it's, it's very cleverly done. It's at Freddy's eye level. Yeah. And he sat there at the table. So you just see the chest and the symbol. And apparently they, they approached Cavill about making the cameo and he was just, it could, they couldn't make it work. So he sort of said to them, don't worry about it. Like it's, you know, go on without me. Don't like, let's don't delay your production to try and get this shot. Like yeah, just, yeah. you, you just do it. it. It didn't work out. It's fine. Cause he, he said that he's gone on record say like, you know, he wanted to do it. Couldn't make it work. He thought, no, no, I'm not going to hold him up. Let's just, you know, leave it that. And as a result, the gag is funnier. Yeah. It's so much funnier because you're like, holy shit, yeah, Superman's yeah. here. You don't see him, but it's like, oh God, he's here. And then it cuts to credits. Like, it's great. Um, so they want to, you know, I don't freaking know. Um, I don't, I honestly don't know. I don't, yeah. I don't fucking know. But what is hilarious is the fan cut. <laughs> I'm so tired the fa- of this The fan cut please. official graphic uh, uses a very specific font for like the fan edit, like <sighs> bit at the bottom. And it's, it's the Mandalorian. It, no, it's the Mandalorian font, <laughs> which is you know it's a good look. It's a good looking font with the little crackles in it and everything. Do you know how we know it's the Mandalorian font? Because when you look at it, the silhouette of the freaking Mandalorians in the middle of the letter A on this Shazam poster. Mm. I mean, jeez, I'm gonna say it. I said to you before we recorded. I've got some. I want to point out that I just know is gonna get some flat. But suck it up, Buttercup. I've been talking a lot recently about fandoms and how fandoms are, for the most part, online. And as far as the loudest corners of them are supremely toxic. And a lot of them are fandoms for things that I have, I've, you know, programmed shows, comic books, everything that I've cared about over the years. And I'm like, oh, it's cool to meet other people who like this stuff. And then you read one comment thread about the topic and you go, or people who who like say they like this stuff, like purport to like it, but apparently yeah. they hate its guts, or they hate other people who like it. Doctor Who has a loudly toxic fandom. Uh, Star Wars has a loudly toxic fandom. The DCEU is probably the most toxic one out there at the moment. Not DC, DCEU. People who read the DC comics, lovely, lovely buggers, friendly. Do you know what I mean? Like, the discourse is much nicer. Don't say that. No, but that's the thing. It will come not, back to bite you in the ass. Not, not all of the fandoms themselves, not all the fandoms are nasty. It is it is a loud minority, but by God, they are loud. That's They are proper loud. Um, and and there are, of course, nice people in all these fandoms. Uh, DC fandom seems really pleasant. DC EU fandom seems really nasty. Do you know which fandom I've noticed? And Instagram suggestions and stuff. And I look on Instagram, like I see a bunch of fan stuff get sent my way because I've used keywords like for various pro- you know, comic book things that then like it recommends more to you. Do you know which fandom seems to be really bloody lovely? And this is going to get comments. Tell me, tell me, tell me. MCU. <laughs> I've never encountered any MCU fandom that is aggressive to other fandoms. That there are problems. There are absolutely problems. There's definitely a lot of um sexualization and shipping going on in a way we like, right, calm down, guys. Calm down just a little bit. 
Keep that. Use that. Put that in your inside voice. <laughs> put that in your inside voice. But you never see them picking fights as much, anywhere near as much as the DCEU side of it all. Whenever I see whenever I see a fan post recommended to me for MCU related stuff, it's people just talking about how much they love a character, love an mm. actor, like you know, oh god, I love this film. What's your favorite moment from this film? Um, you know, like we ship this, we ship that. It's just it's just like people having fun conversations. Whenever I see DCEU stuff, nine times out of ten, it's like this is better than any of that fucking other stuff. This is better than fucking Marvel. This is fucking Shazam's fucking stupid. Watch Batman v Superman. And it's just like. It's what just is with all this negativity. Like, if you're a fan, why can't you just enjoy what you enjoy and celebrate just it got with to other beat people? The chest, haven't they? Like, yeah. it's like this is better than the other thing. Ugh. It's the most pathetic kind of display when people are nasty to others because of something they like that's doing no harm. It's I I put a post out just just to see on Twitter a couple of days ago where I just wrote. Uh, Shazam, Birds of Prey, and Wonder Woman are the only solid DCEU movies. And send tweet. And then I put it out there and I muted the replies immediately because I was like, I, I, I just want to, I just want to <laughs> put it out I'm there. I just know what kind of crap it's going to be. I'm not going to listen to the replies. And then yeah. like a day like a day later, I was like, go on, I'll look at that tweet and see what people said. And there was a couple nice stuff. Um, comic book writer, uh, we've, we've uh, had on our projects before, Dan Slot. Uh, replied with Aquaman's all right, and I said, Dandy "Yeah, Man. Aquaman's Aquaman's fun. It's not what I'm re- I'd return to, but you know, I had a laugh with it." Um, I, it's, and it was, I like Aquaman, but it's very wobbly. I wouldn't call it solid. Oh, and it's not solid it's, at all. It's like a table far, with yeah. one leg shorter than the other three. Yeah, like, it's, if it's, you lean on it too much, it just falls apart. It's it's brainless, and I mean that in a nice way, not in a derogatory way. It's brainless fun. Yeah, it's fun, brainless. Uh, it's like if it's on TV one night, and I'm flicking through channels, and I find out, I'm like, go on then. And I'll leave it on. I'm not sitting there going, I could write a thesis on this. Um, mm. So, you know, uh, simple as that. But one of them, someone just copied and pasted a 50 plus minute video essay called Birds of Prey is Garbage. And I watched about two minutes of it. And it's exactly what you're imagining right now. Um, so I just replied to the person saying, uh, hmm, um, you thought I would want to watch this why and they reply with like i just wondered what you thought of their opinion of the film and then the next tweet was like i i share their opinion i thought maybe like you'd change your mind it's like no 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 i enjoy birds of prey i have a lot of fun with it it's got some flaws but it's pretty decent like dark comedy caper I, it's got I some like great it. action like stuff in it um I, I i like it enough that it's one of the only three dceu movies i've bought so you know like there you go um why do, are people is this a is this like a, an overall thing are people this aggressive in fandoms because they want to change your mind by bullying you is that what it no, is no they just like the conflict it's so sad and it's exhausting it's exhausting <laughs> i love batman great well why don't you take okay. a leaf out of his book All and right. be a good fucking person for christ's sake oh god i don't love batman he's not real I like reading Batman stories. Yeah. I don't trust Usually. anybody who says, I love Batman, but then you mention Adam West and they go, well, not that Batman, that's fucking stupid. Don't Immediately I don't trust them. I'm like, if you like Batman, all Batman is valid Batman in some way. I'm... Here's the thing. The thing that... Oh, wow, the thing's there with you. Yeah. Hey, yeah. hey, boys, it's the ever-loving blue-eyed thing. It's me. The ever-loving blue-eyed thing and Petunia's favourite nephew. Oh, I'll hang out with you because uh, you're shills. Oh, great. Okay. We get to hang out with him because we're shills. Marvel shills. I'll come along <laughs> and say hi before my big screen debut in 2022. <laughs> uh, 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 ben, there's there's been a pandemic, so it's probably going to be a bit later than that. Ah, uh, 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 shucks. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Back to Yancey Street with you. Uh... <laughs> ah, not those mooks. Um, <laughs> Matt Watson, the thing, Fantastic Four 2023 confirmed. Yeah. <laughs> He's also going to be playing Mira in Aquaman 2. Da, what a revolting development. That um, was his Mira. <laughs> uh, yeah, man, fuck, fuck, tribal, fuck fan tribalism, especially in the current climate where there's 
more important things going on than yeah. fucking let's defend rich people who were shits. Yeah. Let's, let's you know, let's that, just listen I... to marginalised people. Let's listen to people of colour. Let's listen to people who've been treated badly in work situations. This is I... a lot. The DCEU fandoms came out in like violent defense of Chris Nolan's uh, the Chris Nolan news this week that he's oh yeah he's uh, a dick and yet I none of them I don't have chairs on my set because if you're sitting down you're not yeah. working. What did you ready to work at a standing desk then, Chris? What a prick! But Christopher Nolan, man, like I, I I've suspected <laughs> for a long time yeah. that he's so far up his own ass. Well, look at his look at his look at his, his tantrums about the fact tenets had to be put yeah. back twice. He's so it's far like, up dude, his own ass that he can't see the world anymore. He's lost touch with it because all he can fucking, see is his own innards. It's a fucking just, pandemic, mm. mate. Like your film can wait. It can wait. It we're he's, in a pandemic. He's, he's got his head jammed up his ass. He's licking the inside of himself, going. Mm. Worst of all mm. was in the Anne I'm Hathaway interview Nolan. where she and, and I taste so good. Mm. I'm trying to I'm trying to I'm talk such a, over this because mm, it's, it's I'm, I'm, I'm such a visionary mm, oh. filmmaker. Mm. My yeah, sphincter no, I... is mm, delicious. That's Christopher Nolan. He's he's the fucking he's he's the boss you have at the shitty fucking retail job or the shitty fast food job that I've had. Yeah, there's a, there's like, a time for leaning and yeah. a time for cleaning. If you've got time to lean, you've got time to clean. Fuck off. He's just one of those people, but he just happens to be a film director. Yeah. Fucking. Yeah, I Dark just... Knight Rises is rubbish. I'm going to mm. say it. I'm going to say it because it needs to be said. I'm going to be the one who speaks truth to power in 2020. The Dark Knight Rises is rubbish. Batman Begins is fine, and The Dark Knight is overrated. <gasps> I've said it. I've said wow. it. I Come for agree. me. I can't agree with you on that one. But Inception totally is good. Fine. Interstellar fine. is good, but it thinks it's more emotionally impactful than it is. The Prestige is fun, because it's just fucking weird. <laughs> the Prestige is fun. It's really fucking weird. He thinks he's smarter than he is, doesn't he? Oh, Christopher yeah. Nolan. Yeah. It's, um... Uh, I didn't let chairs on set because if you're sitting down, you're not working. Oh, sorry. Sorry. I was just tossing myself off. Uh, <laughs> fuck off, um, Chris Nolan. The worst part about it is the interview was, it was an Anne Hathaway interview in Hugh Jackman, like variety actors and actors kind of thing. Oh, piece, yeah, yeah, yeah. In it, Anne Hathaway, she says that, and that was that ended up being the story that spread was like Chris, yeah, uh, yeah. Chris Nolan, you know, doesn't allow people to, he doesn't allow chairs on set because he doesn't want people sitting because like. they're not working. Um, but then, like, she follows it up by saying, like, I mean, personally, I really, I, I thought that was a, a great idea because it kept everyone motivated and this, that, and blah, blah. And it's like, Anne, no, no, it's just no, bullying. because the difference here, Anne, is. Um, you and your fellow co-stars in the movie probably, if you had a bit of downtime, had the power or the privilege to th- you know, throw a quiet tantrum and go to your trailer and sit down, yeah, or just go and sit down because they have to talk to your agent if they have a problem with you doing that, that what kind about, of thing. Yeah. What about yeah. the multitude of people on set who have yes. fuck all to do yes. while they're what waiting about between the shots extras? and setups. What about the grips? Like, what about the lighting team? What about the best boys? What about the catering? What about makeup? What about the camera operators? Like, this is the thing when people heard Deadline and went like, well, you know, it's good films though, isn't it? It's like, yeah, but you don't see all the hundreds of people who probably go home every night from those sets and go, fucking Nolan. Why oh is the God, continuity person is not me. at a desk? Yeah. With like two oh copies of the script. Able to oh cross reference it. Can you imagine being on continuity for a fucking blockbuster film and having to work while standing up? God. Like, you don't have enough hands. <laughs> <laughs> I bet you got them all standing desks and fucking treadmills as well, the wanker. What a prick. And it's just, oh God. It, it, it started the debate again of like, yeah, but if you end up with a good film, like, it's all worth it, surely. Yeah. Tell that to Shelley Duvall. Yeah. And Tell that to Uma I Thurman. You know, like love The Shining, but yeah. But it's you know what's amazing about it? Knowing you know what's amazing the about fucking it? shit that it stars actors, yeah. and those actors could absolutely have you know 
acted that way instead of being forced to feel that yeah. way by a director it, who, it, in, in the it. case of Shelley Duvall specifically, Kubrick treated her like garbage for weeks. It's like, oh, that's the only way I can get the best performance out of it. Kubrick's another one of them. He did make some great films, but he was definitely high on his own supply. And it's, oh, it's God. like, credit where credit is due, but you've got, we've got to stop blowing smoke up these people's asses. It's, yeah, that's, it's what's not, ha- that's probably it, what's, to bring it back to the, where we started, that's probably yeah. what's happened with Joss Whedon. Yeah. He made the yeah. Avengers, and now he thinks, and he's, and he's you know, he's, he, on top of that, he was already so well loved by so many people for Buffy and Angel and Firefly and Dollhouse. Um, and <laughs> so it, he must have been so fucking high on supply so of course he can walk onto a set take over a film that was never his to begin with and then just excise people from it left right and centre treat people like shit because he believes yes he has done good work but he believes he's somehow superior you see you see it in theatre all the fucking time oh Jesus yeah all the fucking time yeah Um, it's one of the things I don't miss about you know, not really being in the industry anymore. Just people. You have to encounter these egos, people who, man. yeah, they they be- they believe that the be all. In- and here's again, here's the thing: there might be people listening, like, what about method acting, like, where people like make certain decisions and this, that, and the other. And, and you know, uh, yes, you can absolutely collaborate with your director to to experiment, to try things, to get you to a certain place or a certain Is it ever state. Fucking worth you it, can though, do you know that, I mean? but like... well, again, it it just depends on different people's methodology, or whatever, but. The way you do it is you fucking communicate and you make a mutual decision to try it. And if at any point you feel like it's the wrong thing to do, you call it off. Like you go, yeah, we're not going to, I can't do it like this. We're not going to do it like this. Like yeah. you have to be, I have to be comfortable enough with you, with your director to be like, okay, so, you know, I need to look, I need to look like I'm literally freaking dying. I need to look like I'm, uh, like my character's been trapped in a thing. I'm skeletal and I'm this, that, and the other. I know we're going to go digital, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to go on like an extreme fast for like two weeks and we're going to try this and we're going to do that. Yeah, okay. And we're going to make sure health, you know what I mean? You you go through checks and you do what you need to do. If you feel like you need to do that as a performer, if that's where you're going to get your best performance, mm. sure, but you stay safe. And you collaborate with your director. You have to be on the same level. You have to be understanding each other. So if Shelley Duvall had turned around to Kubrick and was like, right, for this next week while we're shooting these specific scenes, treat me like shit. Just like really bully me. I want to feel like I'm, I'm under pressure. If she'd said that, or if he'd said, I want to try something where I'm just, I'm going to be a bit cold with you. Like, are you okay with me trying this? And she went, all right, do you know what? Let's give it a go. Like if it was that kind of conversation, Sure, because then adults have consented to experiment to see what if it'll affect the performance or the overall yeah. product. But in these instances, it's directors storming around being utter cunts for no reason, or giving, like you said, shitty retail manager like mindsets to movie sets. For Christ's sake, one of the things I hate about television production um, is is the corporate side of it like the ladder the hierarchy side of it yeah becoming becoming so important that everyone forgets they're there to make entertainment it's like i'm not saying you should come to work and doss around and you know like just piss about but it should at least like you should at least be having fun or 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 a fulfilling creative experience because that will yeah. ultimately show in the end product. It will show if you're having a good time. It will show. Uh, I, I don't. Think, I don't I care think... very much for a lot of Moffat's era of Doctor Who, but the first two seasons of Matt Smith's thing. Yeah, um, he's enjoying himself. Like, you can feel. Yeah. You can feel the Smith Darville Gillen chemistry. Uh, that then when you watch Doctor Who Confidential at the time, you're like, oh my God, those three like wind each other up. They have a laugh. They get on like a house on fire. And you can feel it, even in the crapper stories of like series six, you can feel it on screen that those three are so entwined. And it's, you know, ultimately the end product, like it, the, the end result is a product of the time and effort everyone has put in to the project, put into the mm. film. Um. I wonder, now knowing the sort of stuff we know about Nolan, if I go back and watch some of his older stuff, am I going to feel that cold like indifference in some of it? I've always felt so- Nolan's stuff's kind of soulless. 
That's yeah. what I'm, that's what I'm that's what I was kind of trying to get at before when I said like I like Interstellar quite a lot, but it is for something that's supposed to be emotionally rooted. It is quite soulless. Yeah, it, it's got it has like, moments of like oh my god yeah. that is oh that got me, but then there's a lot of in between. But he's too he's too and it, like Inception, he's so hung up on mechanics. And he makes, yeah. you know, he makes for a satisfying mechanics and spectacle that he's got this, but he's got an emotionally driven protagonist, but you don't really feel the stakes because he's no, no. too hung up on the mechanics of his world he's built and the sort of nuts and bolts of the story mm. and making sure it's all intricate and fits together. It makes you wonder if if the Dark Knight trilogy works sort of a lot better than some of his later stuff in, in terms of like being a bit more visually memorable or distinct because um, of the, because of the iconography of the, the toy box he's playing with for those three movies. Yeah, maybe like, um, like the Dark Knight is a really solid kind of like crime thriller action film that just happens to be about Batman. But now I'm wondering if you took out the Batman trappings from it, would it be like, just kind of okay. I think that's what I mean by being overrated. Yeah. I mean, you're wrong, but... <laughs> I, I'll, I'll own it. I'll own it. I don't care. I'm good with that. <laughs> but I mean, that, there's another one. Like, I will I will never go to bat for David S. Goya, but he was a co-writer on Batman Begins and The Dark Knight. He was not a co-writer on The Dark Knight Rises uh, with the Nolans. And it, yeah. is, it is... Dark Knight Rises is head and shoulders the weakest script of the three. Well, that's what happens when you give Colleen Nolan a superior on the other. <laughs> like, she's just not got the head. Anyone listening to this outside of the UK is like, I didn't get that. Don't worry, it's fine. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> but well, like, you see the you same know. thing with um, with Jonathan <laughs> Nolan's work on Westworld. I like Westworld a lot, but mm. sometimes it does. It's not as bad as, as Christopher Nolan's stuff, but. It, there are points in it where it, it kind of forgets that it's supposed to be emotionally engaging and it's, it's yeah it's too busy sort of trying to show off its complexity it gets yeah. it gets a bit mired down in that in the second season i think they recover it in season three quite a bit but um, it, it forgets like that to, it's, it's not it forget that, yeah it forgets it's a show about robot cowboys not even that it just forgets that you're supposed <laughs> to care about the characters Oh, sorry. No, I, I just mean like, like I, I just mean like it loses. It sort of loses that core concept of going on that journey, uh, and 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 what it means yeah. and the people who experience it. Like it's sort of. I think the best way to compare it is like a modern slasher. So many of them forget to make you give a shit about your cast. Yeah. And and you know, so by the end of it, you're like, oh, the gimmick was cool. Although That's kind of it. If you go back to the Friday the Thirteenth movies, some slasher franchises have never done that. Yeah. So, hey! As I found out the hard way. What um, was the last what was the last great slasher? And I'm including stalking monster films. Cause I think It Follows was probably the last like really solid Ooh, yeah, sort of it's, it not, it's not a slasher in the strictest sense, but it's a, a thing catches up to teens and there's a gruesome death. Yeah, it's got that sense of sort of pursuit to it. Mm. It follows was really good, yeah. That sense um, of oof. Oof. I don't know. Probably, yeah. What, but what's, the that, what's the killer? STDs as STDs. a ghost, basically. Ghost, it's... ghost AIDS. Um, ghost AIDS. <laughs> Gades. No, that doesn't work. <laughs> no, that's that's bad. That is actually, that's bad. That's, that's terrible. quite bad. That's very um, bad. That's not good. <laughs> I apologize. Well, this um, is the last episode of Big Dumb Cast, yeah, everybody. We'll see you all later. Because Chris made a bad joke. Um, <laughs> uh, fucking. I don't know. What is the. the like Predator, <laughs> but yeah, Predator is a slasher film. Um, but like the second half of it, yeah. I mean, Scream's a good slasher, but it's also a deconstruction of slasher films. Oh, you know, I think that counts though. I think Scream counts. Yeah. It yeah. may be a deconstruction, but that often is what helps to revitalize a genre. Throw, um, throw very. Throw. It did. It did kick off a resurgence in the genre for better or worse, mostly worse. Um, mm. So. Well, Speaking of Scream, funnily enough, uh, in Scream Sc- 3, there is a cameo from oh, two pop culture characters. That's a fucking stretch. Who uh, then in turn bring the cast and director of Scream to cameo in, in their first solo movie. 
Oh. Um, those characters are, of course, uh, oh. the, the Viewer Skew versus Jay and Silent Bob, uh, who featured in Clerks, Small Rats, Chasing Amy, Dogma, Jay and Silent oh. Bob Strike Back, and Clerks 2, and most recently on kind of a, a victory lap tour that led to it financially becoming a more successful movie in terms of financial take than Avengers Endgame in 2019. True story. Obviously didn't earn more than, but based on like budget mm. to earnings, it was the most successful movie of 2019. Yeah, okay. And it's just, arri- it's just arrived on Sky Movies on Now TV, which means that you, my friend, finally got around to watching Jay and Silent Bob Reboot. I'm going to say this with a heavy heart. Nope. It's not very good. It's it's lame, isn't it? But I I kind of was I was kind of braced for that because I I saw this uh, a couple of months ago when it came out on DVD release for Region Two, and um, I'm not saying I didn't enjoy it. Yeah, I definitely it, enjoyed myself yeah. watching it. But it's, it's not pleasantly very good. lame. No. Now, when was the last time you watched Strike Back? Oh, fucking over a decade ago, <laughs> easily. Did you feel like? And, and this is completely intentional in the film. You can see it. Did you feel like you were just rewatching Strike Back for at least the first forty-five minutes? Because um, the, I the did. vibe, the music cues, did, 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 bum, bum, and all those little weird. The music like, felt kind of cheap. To yeah, me. yeah, but I mean, if you, if, it's if a you go, cheap movie. If you go back to Strike Back, though, yeah. a lot of it's the same. It's the same, like score and arrangements and, and and everything and it's yeah it, it it's done on purpose to kind of harken because like uh for those who don't know these were a series of comedy films directed and written by kevin smith in the 90s to early 2000s clerks is a drama a sort of comedy drama kind of very simple basically a play on film um, he made he made a bunch of films about a bunch of losers getting stoned and making dirty jokes that's all yeah. you need to say and they're really pleasant a couple of them a couple of them try some a bit deeper like chasing amy deep dives really onto how relationships work and and what attraction actually means it's a film that but it's time very was... of its time and does not work today oh yeah yeah which which kevin smith's acknowledged since he's like yeah, yeah. like uh, the parameters of understanding and everything about sexuality and lgbtq plus representation has has broadened and changed enough now that chasing amy was absolutely a stepping stone for a mm. lot of people growing up in the 90s but like, is now not the thing that you would say. Oh, you have to watch Chasing Amy. Yeah, it's it's, it's, it's of its time. Yeah, yeah. But at the same time, I think I don't think that undervalues like what it did for a lot of people. But simultaneously, um, just view it as one of the viewers' universe films now. Like, just it's... view it as oh, you're gonna watch them all. Yeah, watch Chasing Amy as well. Yeah, well, like Dog- one Dogma's of those. the breakout one. Dogma is the absolute breakout. Dogma, I think I still think to this day is the best thing he's ever made. Uh, people who've never seen any of these other movies. I've probably seen Dogma because yeah. like Channel Four and God knows how many channels here in the UK have repeated it over the years and shown it late night. Um, it's you know it's a biblical, it's basically like a biblical, a biblical fantasy comedy movie that yeah. also happens to be really vulgar. Um, it's got you know a boardroom of executives being slaughtered by an angel. It's got a uh, monster made of shit. Um, <laughs> uh it's got chris rock as the uh the 13th apostle yep which is fucking it's got great. Al- alan rickman as the voice of god the metatron yeah with his yeah. Uh, his lack of genitals um and his uh. vicious haircut and eyeliner uh it's it's great dogma is is fucking great and it, it the only way it's sort of aged is just in the it feels like a 90s movie kind of way just the way it's shot yeah. and the soundtrack yeah, but yeah. i don't think that takes any of its charm away um uh, jane silent bob strike back was the next one which we'll get back to but like that was just a oh these characters have popped up in all the films sod it let's give them their own film yeah. and then clerk clerks 2 closed off the viewers universe it sort of bookended it i think that's the best of the series personally just for script and everything i love clerks too i love it a lot it's clerks was a story mm. about clerks was a story about being in your early 20s and being really upset with where you are in life and clerks too is a story about being in your early 30s and going yeah it doesn't really change does it like that's yeah. kind of the the story and the proposed clerks 3 was going to be about being in your 40s um but he's got a different direction for that apparently now uh uh but yeah it's uh you know, it's 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 vulgar as fuck, and it's it's very low budget. Again, sort of feels that way because it's basically in just one location for the duration, but that kind of works in its favour. 
Yeah. And now James Bond reboot. Uh, Kevin Smith's been wanting to do another film with his VSQ universe characters for ages, and he couldn't because we well, were trying to get uh, Clerks three off the ground for years and years and years. Yeah, and then, we now know that Jeff Anderson, basically yeah. uh, Randall, uh, in the films, said that he didn't want to do it, and it was like, well, we can't do it without him, so I'm not doing it. Then it yeah. was going to be Twilight of the Mole Rats, which was going to be a Mole Rats follow up. Yeah, that was going to be a film. Then it was refitted to be a TV show. It was shopped to a lot of networks. He's not been able to confirm exactly who, but it's believed that HBO and Netflix were in talks about it at one point. Just didn't come around. So yeah, uh, he wanted to do a Dogma sequel. He was contacted by the technically the owner of Dogma, um, about three years ago, Harvey Weinstein who just randomly oh. contacted him out of the blue and said, have you ever thought about doing Dogma? Because we've not got it on Blu-ray. We've not managed to get it out on Blu-ray or on big release. Like, you know, we, oh. we need to do that. Have you ever thought about doing a sequel? To which Kevin, of course, is like, oh God, that's great. Yeah, because like Weinstein and Miramax own Dogma and they own its its world. So, uh, but then two days later, um, the Me Too stuff started and he spoke. Kevin Smith spoke about this recently in an interview. Yeah. Uh, he spoke. He spoke to other directors and producers he worked with in the nineties with Miramax, who have all said, "Yeah, about two days before it happened, he was calling yeah. up loads of people because he and his he and his Harvey Weinstein and his people knew the stories of all of his sexual assaults were about to come out, and he wanted to be like, hey, chums, pals, hey, how's it going? Let's talk business. This is great.' So that when the stories broke, of course, he was hoping people would rally behind him, but nah, it didn't happen. Um, because it's a fucking monster. Um, so he eventually went, fuck it. I own Jay and Silent Bob. I can, I can borrow the characters from the other films, but I own Jay and Bob outright. I'm just going to make Jay and Silent Bob follow up. What was yeah. the first one? It was a goofy stoner movie for the two thousands. What's big now? Superhero movies. Okay. I'll kind of do like a piss takey of the, of, of the culture as it is at the minute. And which is fortuitous because he did have, Jay and Silent Bob Strike Back be about a superhero movie being made about characters in Bob. So yeah, d- kind Jay, of fortuitous in that. Jay, Jay and Bob, as we learn in Chasing Amy, the inspirations for the comic book Blunt Man and Chronic, and in Jay and Silent Bob Strike Back, Blunt Man and Chronic movie is going to be made, and Jay like, and Silent Bob aren't getting any uh, any royalties for it, and they're pissed off, so they're going to go to Hollywood and get it cancelled. Basically, they want to get there and ruin the movie. It's giggle worthy, but it is a bit crap in it. Oh, like, so, uh, Strike Back is crap, but it's like really No, but fun. like, just like the concept. Oh, it's yeah. It's like the jokes nowadays, like, oh, you're piss funny when you're 14. And oh, like, yeah. Oh, oh, oh it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's the, uh. tied with Mall Rats, it's the films, it's, they're the two films in the series where it's mostly just immature as fuck, and that's kind mm. of the point. It's just sort of like dumb and stupid and and a bit weedy, but it, but it's, it's the kind of Looney Tunes-esque charm of Jason Mewes as Jay is just weirdly endearing because you're like you are a bizarre man and he's, he's channeled... a strange man I, I saw him live last year he came uh to the uk like and just did some standards called amusing stories which just basically monologuing for an hour and a half and just telling stories and he's really fucking lovely to listen to because he's he's lived through some shit he's yeah, gone through some yeah. utter shit uh, a lot of it put upon himself, a lot of it genetically inherited, all of it to do with drugs. Yeah, a um, lot of addiction issues. And and it's like when you watch him do his, do his monologues and stuff, it's like watching um, somebody who is not an actor who's been encouraged by a friend to like, you know, oh, no, come on, give it a try. Come to this class with me. Like, give it a go. And whilst doing it, you can tell that he's having the fucking time of his life and really enjoying it. Yeah, and I, and I don't mean that in like, oh, bless him. I mean that in like, no, he was really engaging because you could see that he's like, okay, this is not my wheelhouse. Five minutes into the set, it was like, oh, you've got the whole room in your hand. This is great. You know what I mean? This is awesome. He feels like he feels like a mate that you're drinking with has suddenly gone up and done a stand up set and, yeah. and smashed it. And, and the character of Jay is based on sort of younger him, and I think he's the reason why Jay and Silent Bob Strike Back does still kind of work as a daft movie to revisit because his energy and like the Looney Tunes esqueness is just fucking weird. Yeah. Jay and Silent Bob reboot. Kevin Smith has a heart attack, rewrites Jay and Silent Bob reboot off the back of it and decides to basically make it a uh, a remake, reboot and um, a retelling of Jay and Silent Bob Strike Back all at the same time. Yeah. The first half of the movie 
is a piss take of reboots and remakes being samey and pointless. And then the second half turns into a story about family and the weird lens you'll go to to look after your family. Um, doesn't always work. No, but I, do, but I don't think I don't think it wanted to be profound. I think it's it found kind of that, like found that sort of emotional stuff as they made it. It sort of feels like yeah, it's it's but, charming, but in a just a bit of a crap way. Yeah, like yeah. Oh, this is. Like everyone's really enjoying themselves, and yeah, look how uh, much fun everyone's having. But and the the cameos are sort of a testament oh. to how much people were like, "Oh, this will be a laugh. Fuck it, come on, I'm in. Let's go for it. Let's do it." Yeah, because he gets gets all his famous mates to be in it, basically. Yeah, um, the only the only major player that you think of from Strike Back as like a key component, like you know, I mean, you know, you got your Will Ferrells and your Chris Rocks and stuff, but the only major yeah. player that you think of as a component who couldn't make it back was Mark Hamill. And yeah, because, yeah, and that's because he he <laughs> he found out. He said he'd love to. He got in touch with his people, and his people got back to him and Kevin and went, "Look, no offense, but the mouse probably won't allow this because <laughs> uh, it was during it was during the sequel trilogy's production. It was like, uh, okay, uh, like if he was playing a character, he'd probably get away with it. Uh, the fact that he'd be playing Mark Hamill means that, yeah, yeah. um. Because it is a very vulgar film. Oh yeah, and not like uh, in a crass way, just in a silly way. Yeah, it's 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 um, I think it's one of the least uh vulgar ones of the series. But it is a yeah, it's the sort of thing that people would be like, oh, I love Mark Hamill. I don't know what this is, but I'll watch it. And they'd be like, oh, why fuck is Mark no. Hamill making dick jokes? Yeah. Um, yeah. Long story short, Jane and Silent Bob Strike Back is about them going to Hollywood to stop a movie of their likenesses getting made. In Jane and Silent Bob Reboot. A remake of that movie's being made, and they're going to Hollywood to stop it being made. And the, uh, and that's it. And the, the, the conceit this time isn't that people will make fun of them. The conceit this time is their names are being used in it, and yeah. they won't have legal right to their own names going forward. So they want to basically like make sure they can still be called Jay and Silent Bob. Yeah, there's, um, there's definitely an element of let's. This gives us a chance to poke fun. Uh, 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 what are the difference between reboots and remakes and you know terminology and uh, you know when it's not working it feels like an extended like weed fueled sort of ramble and that's the thing with this this is when it the is first working film, this is the first film it feels he's like ever made. an extended weed fueled ramble <laughs> this is the first stoner film he's made where he's actually a stoner as well yeah he, like he wasn't a weed smoker during all those earlier flicks Listen, I've got a love. I've got a lot of love for Kevin Smith, but it's not his heavy weed usage, and it can't just be that because he is also older than he was. Obviously, his, his heavy weed usage and his advancing age that sounds like he's fucking ancient. Um, he's, he's maturing, shall we say? Have not yeah. made him a better filmmaker. No, no, I no, love him. No. I've, I've, I've got I... nothing but time for Kevin Smith. He's, he's like <laughs> seems like he's genuinely one of the loveliest guys in showbiz. I think his best his best movie, weirdly, but... is in terms of just on a technical level, the performances in it, the writing, the the vibe, is Red State, is horror film. Red State, Red State, uh, is yeah, really I keep good. About Red State, Red State's really fucking good. You know, Zach Zach and Mary make a porno is also on a technical level a really good movie as well. Hey, I really like, like Zach and Mary. It's, it's really solid, but um, Red State's fucking amazing, <laughs> and it's like. I I yeah. enjoy Tusk. Not everyone loves Tusk. It's I've still fucking, not seen it. Yeah. It's horrible. Like it is really uncomfortable and grotesque, and and and. But it's it's a it's a it's a comedy horror. So it's one of those where it's like sometimes you laugh because you're meant to. Sometimes you're freaked out because you're meant to be, and sometimes you're freaked out or you laugh and at a bit that you're not meant to be freaked out or laugh by. And you're like, oh, huh. I've still not got around to yoga hoses, but I'm curious. Um, and I've still not got around to yoga hoses. Uh, but Red Red State is the only one he's made that's a pure horror. Yeah, and it's great. He, he made a segment for the film Holidays, which I have seen, which is really creepy. Um, the hmm. bunch of directors made like short horror films as part of a a, a compilation film. Yeah, yeah. Um, and his is about uh, cam girls getting revenge on a on a possessive pimp. It's really good, yeah. really horrible and uncomfortable. Um. And and makes you uh, want to hide your genitals in a, a safe box, but uh, at the bottom Not of the ocean. Not a bad idea. Yeah. But um, just like Bob Rubin, it's, it's. I think once you get past the fact that it just isn't 
particularly clever or, or, or has anything going. <laughs> it's not big and it's not clever. Yeah. Um, but but it's the, a bunch of the, people who are having fun together, being together and just playing around. So it kind of charms you in that way. Where you're just I like, mean, this is a bit crap, but I, I can't I can't bring myself to sort of dislike yeah. it because it's not doing any harm, is it? it? It's sort of a self-aware two and a half stars, basically, it's isn't it? It's so self-aware. Like, yeah. it's constantly drawing attention to how how crap it is. How silly yeah. it is! Yeah. How stupid the fucking um, premises, the, the premises, uh, the callbacks. How, uh, how yeah, how obvious some all of the, the best callbacks call, are. Some of the best callbacks are the subtle ones and the ones that aren't even like phoned in or or, or highlighted. Like there's there's the guy in the back of shot when they're leaving the um, I think it's the either the airport or the movies. There's a guy in the back of shot just drinking from two coffee cups. Yeah. <laughs> He's in Strike Back. Yeah. They leave a location in Strike Back and he's just in the back of shot drinking from two coffee cups for some reason. It's You're just like, Why? silliness. Um, Those things were... And, and his... I mean, it, it's... If you've ever been a fan of the Jew Skew stuff, it's it's full of stuff just to make you go, oh, 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 that's cool. Like, some um, of it... Uh, some of it really, really, like, egregiously doesn't work. Like, the Fred Armisen hmm. stuff just fell. Fred, Fred really Armisen's really funny. Really flat for me. He, he's really funny, but it, I know what you mean. It just sort of... Overall, it's like, wh- why? Why is this here? Yeah. Um. Um. The 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 thrust of the plot after the remake premise is that along the way Jay meets up with uh, <laughs> Boo Boo Kitty Fuck. Um. Fuck you now. <laughs> from the last movie, from Strike Back, and learns that he has a daughter, but his daughter doesn't know that he's the dad. And yeah him and his daughter end up basically going on this road trip. Like, him and Bob are essentially taken hostage, but the look, the destination is the same. Um, so they go along with it. Uh, and Jay kind of comes to terms with the fact that he's a father and he feels like he should have been there for her. One of the things that did kind of work for me in this is, is sort of oddly, you know, places it did feel in this weird comedy, is Jay Muse can play the emotional stuff really fucking well. Yeah, like, <laughs> when he has to do... Like, probably the best... It's, it's the bit where they, the it's the bit where him it. and Millie have to part at the con at the end, where they don't think they're going to see each other again. With the two groups of thingy, and she yeah. doesn't know he's she doesn't know he's her dad, and and do you know what I mean? Uh, but the, it's the, there's it's obviously the a connection, ends. and and they the sort song. of like they're, they're, they're fucking heartbroken at the fact they're not actually going to they're probably not going to see each other after this moment. It's like, for, oh god, you two are playing this really well. For me, the strongest stuff in it is that that sort of the two scenes that bookend the third act of drinking a coffee with your old man yes and then Stuff. and then the, and then the, the closing the, end, the, the, post, the post-credit stop. scene yeah um where we learn finally why there was gum in the lock in the first clerks <laughs> putting gum in the lock for 25 years which is wonderful <laughs> uh and I did, is, that did get a big honk out of me actually it is I got great. a really big honking laugh out it of is me. great to see brighter hollering um, as well like it's really, it's genuinely lovely when yeah. he pops up as as uh, Dante yeah. in yeah. the stuff because you're like, oh, there he is. Because you suddenly remember the film you fell in love with that made yeah. you want to follow the rest of the movies, and you know, and uh, it sucks that Jeff Anderson wasn't there. But there's sort of like a a throwaway visual gag as to why Randall yeah. might not be there, yeah. which is the RST video has been closed and gutted out into their like private weed farm. But out in front of where what was RST video is a red box. Yep. <laughs> so it's like, yeah, that makes sense. The video store would have closed and been replaced by a rental kiosk. That and makes sense. The the <laughs> stuff with with Bob like doing emojis, like typing on his phone for ages and then be, being one emoji really didn't work for me. Oh yeah, that should have been and that should have been a throwaway. Doing gag. it, that should have been a throwaway. That's, that's gag. definitely one of the things where someone would have been like, uh, Kevin, like. <laughs> Maybe don't, yeah? Maybe don't do that one. Um, Maybe don't. Um, but the fact that he, he, he turns up as, him, as himself and is incredibly self-deprecating is... Like, the self-deprecating humour of it is yeah kind of part of its charm. It's like, yeah. oh, it knows how crap this is. And then, of course, there's the Ben Affleck scene, which is... Which was a, which was a late yeah. edition. It was yeah. a real late edition. He, he uh, uh, on a junket, was asked for whatever the Netflix film was that came out, like, a year and a half ago. He was asked... Um, a bite. There's a guy called Kevin something who's in one of the 
he does interviews for like Fox's junkets or whatever. Yeah, yeah. And whenever he meets somebody who was in a View Askew film, he always breaks the ice before the question start properly with a question about something from one of those films. Just because he, he loved them growing up and he was like, sod it. So he said to Ben, he said, hey, Jay and Bob Reboot, uh, you playing out what you're doing? And he was like, no, no one's asked me. And, I, and I'm available. I'm really available for like the next couple of months. So if they want if they want me, they can have me. And he was like, oh. And Kevin Smith hadn't really talked to Ben Affleck much over the years, over the last few years. Uh, he'll never outright say why, but you can kind of glean it from various things that basically Kevin is very open, does his talks, does his tours. Um, does his podcasts about his life and tells stories. And Jennifer Garner, who was then married to Ben Affleck, is very private and does not like the idea of people hearing stories about her life being told. So it sounds like it was kind of a, you know, uh, the, 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 the wife over the mate, like kind of, yeah, you uh, he's not coming to the party. Yeah, he's not coming to this thing. No, do you know what I mean? And it just... Understandable. They, drif- they drifted... Uh, but Kevin reached out to Ben when he found out about this, and Ben was like, fuck yeah, like let's do it. So originally he was going to be Cockknocker, apparently. He was going to write him in as Cockknocker, because he uh... could have him for one day. So he was going to be the villain at the end. And then um, it hit him, apparently, like two days before shooting, that no, he should reprise his role as Holden from Chasing Amy, because if it's a blunt yeah. man and chronic, uh, Chronicon, as it's called, uh, which is a pretty decent play on words. Um, yeah. If it's gonna if yeah. it's gonna be that, why wouldn't you have him reprise the role of the guy who created those characters in Chasing Amy? It makes sense. And the scene kind of sums up what the whole sort of emotional point of the movie is about. Like y- y- your life as you know it ends when you have a kid, and that's yeah. fine yeah. because it's not your story anymore; it's your kid's story. And it's like, okay, so that's what the core of the movie essentially is. But it also ends up acting as a sequel to Chasing Amy. You find out what's happened to um what's happened to uh uh Holden and Alyssa's like relationship since the events of Chasing Amy. And it's like Oh And the that... acknowledgement that yeah, Chasing Amy was made today, it shouldn't be made by a cis white dude. Yes. It's and it's sort of like, okay, so he gets to have they just his, his cake and share it. it. Yeah. yeah. Plus, she, of course, you get a fucking Batfleck joke snuck in there as well. Um, it's the look the camera does. Yeah. Yeah. It's fucking beautiful. Um, th- there's a bunch of View Askew cameos, like uh, the, the Walton and Bride, the comic book yeah, men make a brief appearance. Stuff. Cast of Clerks make a brief appearance. Um, you know, some characters from the others. He gets Matt, da- they get Matt Damon in. And they just basically make him a bit of linking narration because they had him for one day in LA yeah. after the shoot had finished and they knew they could get him. And it was like, he had an idea for what he wanted. And then apparently Jen, Ken's wife, uh, Kevin's wife went like, why don't you do something with Loki? Like you, you can't do anything from dogma, but no one owns the angel Loki. So just do it. Yeah. So they did. <laughs> they fucking did. So you get a bit of interlinking narration and random dogma like um sequel sort of tease in terms like, of the dialogue. It comes out of nowhere. It yeah. brings the film to a screeching fucking halt. Yeah. But you're just like, oh, it's Matt Damon. It, it, like, it, it's just, the, 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 cameo, just... the cameos in Strike Back work better because they're subtler. Yeah. Like you, ca- you carry Fisher and, and everything. Yeah, like. they're yeah. just, and George Carlin. Like they just kind of happen. Uh, I love that Deirdre Bader reprises his role as the security guard because that yeah. is one of the more fun gags from the original. Yeah. Um, uh, a bunch of Smodco people pop up in there. Like Ralph Garman's got quite a, a memorable bit as an incredibly aggressive man who screams his credit card details out and enables the plot to move forward. Yep. Uh, did you spot Mark Bernardin? Yep. Looking yeah. straight down the barrel right of down the, the camera. camera. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, uh, so you know, there's, there's there's plenty of fun to be had with all that stuff, uh, and then you get just you you sort of celeb cameos who he's either worked with or just asked, and they went fuck yeah, I'll do it. So like Craig Robinson obviously worked with him on um, Zach and Mary briefly. He pops up. Oh, I love seeing Craig Robinson. Yeah, Joe. Every Magnanello. time Craig Robinson pops up in something, I'm just like, all right, we're all right for the next five yeah. minutes. <laughs> uh, uh, Joe Manganiello rocks up. Yeah, as the yeah. big beefcake that he is. Um, and has an entire like comedic exchange about Power Rangers uh, with Justin <laughs> Long, who, of course, coming back, playing his character from Zach and Miri, but not in name because they don't own the copyright to that because like, yeah. Zach and Miri's owned by whoever it's owned by. But he's basically playing that character. 
So his gay porn star is now a lawyer. Um, sure. It's not bad. It's not bad. Um, I'll, I've, I've got time for just a long one. Uh, Kate McCutcheon um, as the movies employee. Yes. Uh, Shannon Elizabeth obviously comes back as... as uh, Which is Kitty a hell of a get. Yeah. Because yeah. she's basically retired, isn't she? Yeah, she's she's done with acting. She's an activist now, and it's, it's she's just like, you want me to come back? Fuck yeah, let's do it. And she looks like she's I I, think aged. She looks like she's aged maybe five years, and it's that's one of those it. Things like <laughs> we're talking about how fucking toxic Joss Whedon are, and Joss Whedon is, and fucking how much dickheads on set Christopher Nolan and Stanley Kubrick could have been. Like yeah. Kevin Smith must be the nicest fucking dude. Oh, the, like, the, the, C- to get the CW people to come and DC do shows. silly shit like this for no money. Oh yeah, well the I... CW DC shows keep asking him back because like Melissa Bernoist from uh, Supergirl and Grant Gustin that from Flash have, have said in yeah. interviews lots of times. When we have a Kevin episode, it's like the coolest thing ever because the vibe is just so chill. Like we're with somebody who's more fascinated by what we're doing than he is by <laughs> than he is by meeting deadline. Which sort of just is fine because the days will always overrun, but you don't feel like they are when the director is loving every second of being yeah. there and being very vocal about it. Yeah. Um, he always, like, on the first day, he directs apparently, he always, like, buys a massive lunch order for everybody and just, like, you know, gets it in, like, buys it for catering as well. And he's like, sod it, there you go, lunch is on me today. Like, there you go, everybody. You know, it's it, he clearly is someone who's fun to work with. And that's why you're able to rope in the cameos, like, Chris Hemsworth, who pops up very briefly as a holographic Chris <laughs> Hemsworth. Very funny. Um, you've got, uh, you've got, uh, fuck, fuck, fuck. I mean, obviously you've got um, Harley Quinn Smith and, and and the gang who are kind of a version of the cat burglars in the first film, but now they're yeah. like millennial activists. Some of those jokes work really well. Some of them really don't work. Yeah. But but ultimately, I think the four girls as performers are just, they're all very good. Like, yeah. they're all going yeah, for this it. Yeah, it's a nice group. Um, it's a really good cast. It's just, I, I, it would have been nice for maybe someone to look over the jokes with them and go, maybe don't do that one. Yeah, maybe some of the gags more, just don't work. Yeah, maybe do more of that. Maybe do none of that. <laughs> like, yeah. Let's see how this works. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think. There's other big cameos. Oh, fuck. Yeah. Well, we, Melissa Benoist. I mean, um, the Blunt Man and Chronic reboot. We see some footage from it. Uh, yeah, oh, of course, yeah. Of course, because uh, Jason Biggs and uh, uh, James Van Scott Vanderbeek. Van James Vanderbeek. Uh, reappear on a panel for the original Blunt Man and Chronic movie, yeah. slagging it off. Um, but then you get um, in the reboot, uh, Tommy Chong is Alfred because there's Alfred now. <laughs> that is fucking which is fair great. enough because there is Alfred in in the comics and and in the super groovy cartoon movie where Neil Gaiman voices him. So you know, fair enough. But yeah. it's Tommy Chong essentially like giving the giving the film his stoner film blessing of blessing by being in it. It's just like <laughs> it, I think it that that moment encapsulates the entirety of the film. Yeah, like just being Tommy Chong getting stoned, talking shit for in a five minutes cave. straight. Yeah, and just again bringing the film to a screeching fucking halt just to be silly. Just to be Tommy Chong, you know, and it's just, um, and they're just like, oh yeah, this film doesn't really work on any level, but I think I'm, I think I'm quite enjoying it. Yeah, like, and and is... Melissa Benoist as Chronic, yeah, and uh, and um, Val Kilmer as Blunt Man. <laughs> Val Kilmer as Blunt. Man. Do you know how that came about? Um, because Val Kilmer's got fuck all else to do. Well, he's he's he still he still makes films. He works in production. He doesn't act often because apparently his vocal cords. Yeah, are because fucked. he was in um, the Snowman. Yes, that but like butchered in editing my uh, Michael Fassbender detective film. Yeah, and all his you should have fucking... caught me and all that shit. Yeah, yeah. uh, watch the the Folding Ideas video and it's fascinating. Yeah, but like coming out like from that video I learned that like not only did I learn that Val Kilmer is in that film because I didn't know he was in it but like all his scenes are overdubbed because of whatever he's had done with his face whether it was yeah. plastic surgery or medical I'm not, I'm not sure if he's had plastic surgery and also had issues with his face and throat that have required surgery or if it's all medical issues whatever a, a procedure has led to his vocal cords being heavily affected. Yeah, and his and his lips and mouth, so he can't really speak very well. So, so where, where, all his when, stuff in in the snowman is is dubbed and dubbed badly. Yeah. 
so he his agent or he got in touch with Kevin Smith saying because they they shot reboot mostly in New Orleans. Yeah, and they got in touch with him, and just said we're in we're in New Orleans working on a on a film project. Like, it's like pre production for something. Um, do you, do you want us in it? Like, because I think Kevin had tried to work with Val Kilmer on a previous project and it hadn't worked. So he's like, yeah, do you want yeah. me in it? Do you want me to come in? Like, is there you know is there room for me to do something stupid or whatever? And Kevin was like, well, it's funny you should say this because <laughs> we are do- we are doing a day of green screen filming, uh, like in week three. Uh, when you're there and it's for the blunt man and chronic movie so it's basically a batman and robin piss take film yeah um we haven't cast blunt man yet do you want to be blunt man because because he i think i think val kilmer or his agent jokes in the thing like, like val said or val himself actually said like um yeah, vocal cords ain't great, so I could be Silent Bob's uncle or something, whatever you want yeah. to do. And he said, well, funnily enough, like, <laughs> if you play Blunt Man, you don't have any lines, and you're also basically giving us, like, the biggest sort of kudos that our Batman parody is being played by a Batman actor. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like, okay, sure. And it works fine, because obviously he doesn't say a word in it, but he, he looks all intense and is in this, like... These really well made like remakes of the costumes that look yeah, more like considering they're only on costumes. screen for five minutes. They're made by yeah. apparently they're made by um it's either the it was either the effects guy who he's worked with on Tusk and Yoga Hoses because he did a lot of the visual effects for this yeah um but some of the costumes in the film and it's probably those superhero ones were made by the guys who did the costumes for the CW shows. Oh uh, yeah, that makes sense. Which is why it's kind of cool that Supergirl that is chronic. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> which is a nice little like, hey, there she well, is. they already have her measurements. Yeah, <laughs> well, there you go. Um, um, they just spray painted one of Kara's costumes and <laughs> like put a, put a big yeah, for the, the front. The 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 season four whatever one with the trousers or whatever season yeah. it is. They just spray painted it white. Um, um, it's ultimately I think it's just harm. It's harmless fun. It's harmless. It's mostly enjoyable if you know the other films. Yeah. If you don't, well, if you don't, you'll I, be like, oh, cameo. Oh, cameo. Well, it's like oh, I said cameo. to you when I texted you about it. Like, I laughed quite a bit. I rolled my eyes a lot. And sometimes I was doing both at the same time. Yeah. So, like, it, it's... Uh, like, it's, but, it's just rubbish, but it's quite fun rubbish. Like, it's, it's just charmingly it, crap. It's not pretending to be anything more than it is. And I think it, everyone, it, yeah. everyone in it... Everyone in it knows that and goes for it. Like they, they have fun. They don't phone it in. They have fun. It's a bunch and of movie. It's a bunch of mates made a, a silly movie for no money with a bunch yeah. of in jokes that only them and a few people who watch it will get and yeah. had a blast. Yeah, pretty much. And you uh, know, it's with, with a really nice fine. Jason Mewes performance at the center of it, basically. Yeah, <laughs> like, it's, it's it's all the things that Adam Sandler's phoned in films could be. If he actually but, but gave at a shit half about the him. budget, yeah, yeah, at half the budget, <laughs> and uh, their budget's half an Adam Sandler um, uh, buddy comedy, and uh, yet ha- still like got Hemsworth in it. <laughs> half the budget and twice as funny. Um, but yeah, we've talked about it for way way longer than it way deserves. Longer, yeah, so let's let's get to some emails. Rapid Let's fire emails. emails with the big old mouthpiece and um, a dirty little dirty well, we little dirty little hat. We didn't do anything last week, so we'll pick up with some stuff that missed our fourth birthday. Um, what? We turned four? Yeah, we turned four. Come, we come, What's that? Come. Fucking fireworks. What's going on? Um, <laughs> weirdness. Uh, so <laughs> it's, it's too late, guys. The fourth birthday was a couple yeah. of weeks ago. So this one comes in from uh, Jacob. He says, uh, Hey, Jacob. Oh, hi, Cocker. Hi, Cockle. I'm pardon me. Roy Cockle. Roy Cockle, a.k.a. Jacob. Uh, happy fourth <laughs> birthday. It's hard to believe it's been four years of nerdy news and geeky gossip already. I think my favourite episode has to be 79, a very drunken holiday special, where you both get smashed and watch the Star Wars holiday special and Matt becomes increasingly distressed about why the Stormtroopers are holding their blasters wrong. <laughs> oh, I forgot about that. It's distra- it did, wind, it's it did di- wind you up a fair bit. It's very distressing. Um, a close <laughs> second would be... <laughs> stir whip stir whip 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 stir, whip, whip, stir. <laughs> uh, a close second would be fucking hell 121 i'm sorry about venom 
where oh. you two and, and Billy Dan and John, special guests, discuss the wonderful mess that was Venom. Um, <laughs> they're saying that they have not been my. They're saying that they have not been my favourite guests on the show. Mister Guy Lambert would have to take the cake for that. I know he murdered Richard Herndl to steal his horn, but you should get him back on. Y'all have, a, <laughs> y'all have become a highlight of my week, especially during lockdown, so thank you both. I'll piss off now. Uh, I hope you both are as pissed as a fart by now. Lots of big damn love, Jacob. Don't You don't have to piss off, Jake, Jacob. Just don't piss on us. Um, it's not very good. <laughs> not unless it's a special occasion. Mm. Just heard fireworks at our end as well. Yeah, I don't know what's going on. Anyway, anyway it's because they're, they're obviously uh, heralding the return... Of, of Dan saying hello big dumped custard cream uh, sorry I missed the first the fir- the fourth ah the fourth a fourth damniversary oh oh why haven't we done that one uh, too late now god we're damn it that, we're using that next year uh, got a couple of random if there is one we got a couple of random <laughs> questions we'll 2021 might that. not happen uh, which musicians would you like to see a biopic about Oh. Uh, there can be anyone you just want to know more about or a person you think deserves to have their story shared. Big damn bonus question is who would you cast as that person slash band? Um, oh. Crit. We'll get to that in a sec. We'll get to it in a sec. Chris, yeah. what's the weirdest place you've been recognized by someone? <laughs> um, and a silly bit of shit to finish off. You boys and the rest of the last lineup of five food fans are running a bar slash restaurant. What do you call it and who does what? Have a good one. Fuck off Google and fuck me on visual. Um, fuck off Google should become a new uh, sign off. Until uh, we get sponsored by Google. Yeah. <laughs> and then we have to backtrack it. It's like, um, Is it just me? Or have ads been getting a lot worse on YouTube recently? Oh, I've had three ads before a video recently, yeah. I've had yeah. I've had a I've had a two ad before a video, and then three minutes into a video I had another two ads. Yeah. It's yes. fucking horrible. Um, anyway, that's not, that's apropos of fuck all, um, which, <laughs> that should be the title of uh, the episode, apropos, apropos of fuck, of fuck all. all, uh, <laughs> there's still time, uh, which musicians <laughs> would you like to see a biopic about, and Ooh. if, any ideas, who would you cast as them, um, oh god, um, oh no, I don't know, you know, um, Kirsty McCall. And who would you cast as Kirsty McCall? Uh, the ghost of Kirsty McCall. No, uh, I don't know. Whoever's got the musical talent to pull it off. I guess. Yeah, if I, oh, my sure. my kind of sort of <laughs> feeling about this is that it should be someone who can actually play uh, slash sing the stuff. So I think yeah, that was a big I mean, part of what made. Your benchmark's uh, got to be like Jamie Foxx in Ray, kind of like. It's got to be that yeah, kind of, yeah, yes, yeah, yeah. that's the person for this. Uh, um, or Taron Egerton singing in, uh, I don't know if you play the piano, but singing in uh, Rocket Man. Rocket um, Man, yeah. God, Rocket I'd, wa- I'd, I'd want the film to be more in the style of Rocket Man than any other music biopic. Like, unreliable narrator, not, obviously not the same formula, but like that whole unreliable narrator, the songs are... You know, non-diegetic and our dream sequences or narrative yeah. move-ons, like are basically music videos within the the film. Like, I just don't want to see another Bohemian Rhapsody. Oh God, no! I, I, don't, I just don't. I just don't want to see Bohemian Rhapsody ever again. Um, I'd like. Um, I'd like something. I'm not sure. I'd want biopics necessarily as like moments in time, sort of in various musical scenes. So like a film about the rise of the Bay Area thrash scene, which gave us uh, in like the early eighties, which gave us Metallica, Megadeth, Mm. um, Slayer, all that stuff, Anthrax. And or or more specifically the sort of fallout of of Metallica and and Dave Mustaine, which led to the formation of Megadeth and like Dave Mm. Mustaine getting kicked out of that band. Yeah, um, that'd be a good one. Actually, that'd be a good topic. Yeah. Um, uh, give me I'm... a ha- give me a hand drawn animated biopic of David Bowie that is just Ooh. a big old visual fever dream. Because we've never had a hand drawn uh, animated biopic. No, we, we've had we've had biographical films that are animated. Like what was the Vincent Van Gogh one from a couple of years ago that was like completely done in his art uh, style? Loving Vincent. That, yes. Yes. Yeah. 
Like that yeah. sort of stuff could be done. Do that for Bowie because you can't um, you can't capture Bowie on film. And do do what you did with the Bob Dylan film. Have different people voice yeah. him at different parts of the story, but one of them has to be Jermaine Clement. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, did Brett, you... it's me, David Bowie from the movie Labyrinth. <laughs> He's just you... walking down the wall. <laughs> did you ever read the original graphic novel, The Fifth Beetle? No. Tell me it's of The Fifth Beetle. It's very good. It's about um, Brian Epstein, their, yeah. their, their first manager. Yeah. And it's like, it's about his personal life um, as like a closeted gay man in the the early 60s the swing in 60s and, and, everything and goes like, but will still be really really judgmental if you're gay yeah and sort of like navigating that along with sort of nudging the beatles into stardom yeah it's okay. really really gorgeously drawn and written it's well worth a look well that's the thing it's um, a graphic novel so it's already like already set up to be that as its reference as its source material like yeah. hey this works well in illustrated form. Let's animate this. It, it, it puts me in mind of something like Persepolis, where you could just take that art style and put it on screen. Yeah. Like, it's that sort of beautiful, sort of washed uh, line work. Um, it's really, uh, the, really worth the, a read. The other one is um, is an Alice Cooper biopic. But I don't know who'd play young Alice Cooper. But whoever play <laughs> at some point you've got to do present day Alice Cooper, and he has to be played by either Alice Cooper, who of course is a performer. Every time he's gigging on stage, yeah. it it is a show. It's not a gig. It's a show. Or yeah. Henry Winkler, because Henry Winkler dressed up as Alice Cooper in a CBBC yeah. show yeah, called Hank right. Zipser, and he looks like him. It's terrifying. Yeah. yeah okay. Okay. In fact, I um, think I have a picture. <laughs> <laughs> because I had to be like, this isn't real. I, this, I I'm I sure it. that's Alice Cooper cameoing in this show. Um, um, I will. I think I will I find think, him. Uh, a film about the uh, sort of the rise of the Seattle grunge scene in the early '90s, late '80s would be interesting. Uh, maybe something mm. centered around the sort of breakup of Billy Corgan's relationship with Courtney Love that led to her then getting together with Kurt Cobain. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that sort of... I don't want to do it like a Sid and Nancy, Kurt and Courtney thing. Show no, me the thing. no, no. Oh, okay. That's it. That's... <laughs> that's Henry Winkler dressed up as Alice Cooper. That's Alice Cooper. That's, that's just Alice, Alice Cooper, Cooper, right? Yeah. It's um, weird. Has it's anybody brilliant. ever seen them in the same room at the same time? No, um, but they are as wholesome as each other, so... Yeah, oh, that's so I love that about, I love that about Alice Cooper, like... Oh my god, Lucy is the bigger Alice Cooper from the house. She was like, this heyday, you got these parents' groups like going, it's disgusting, all this violence and rock and roll and this and the other. And, you know, teaching our children bad influence. And it's like, his biggest hit is a song about how it's great that it's time for school holidays. But also blow the school up. Yeah, but like in the way a kid says, blow it up, man. It's not a, it's yeah. not remotely threatening. Um, how the about. It's called School's Out for the Summer. <laughs> How I can't about... even think of a word that rhymes. Like it's, it even admits that it's a dumb song in the song. It's great. How about a Black Sabbath biopic? Oh. The early days of Black Sabbath. Yes. Yes. Who was Ozzy, though? Because that's the that's your selling point. Whoever that's you what cast I'm trying to rack my brain about Ozzy. now. Oh, Who God. is Ozzy? <gasps> See, this is just the ways... This is just the directions I go in because of the music I listen to. So it's going to be very, unfortunately, as much as I'd love to, you know, put more, um, more actors from, uh, minority, minority backgrounds into this kind of thing. Like, I, unfortunately, most of the music I had listened, <laughs> that comes to mind when I listen to this sort of shit is like, oh, it's a bunch of white dudes. Um, which is not terribly, you know, necessarily interesting. Um, but I, I don't know. That's just what I know. <laughs> I so. was going to say, I was going to say that the, the music biopic I really do want to see is Aretha Franklin, but we're getting it. It's toward the end of this year. So. Oh, fair. <laughs> you know. Awesome. Awesome. Um, yeah, that'll be, that'll be good. I'll look forward to that. Uh, so yeah, and that, that's, I've got ideas for like periods I want to see sort of dramatized. I'll see stories set in, but nothing like a specific person. Maybe Black Sabbath. Mayhaps, see mayhaps. How fucking wild Ozzy was, but um, 
Chris, what's the weirdest place you've been recognised by someone? Um, no. Oh, how do you? Uh, I don't know why I sounded like Voldemort. It just seems to be how I exhale now. Um, you know, Voldemort, he may, he may have wanted the death of all non-magical people on this planet and the subjugation of those he felt were unworthy, but do you know what he wasn't? Transphobic. Yeah. Uh, so there we are. Um... <laughs> I mean, she is, she has doubled down this week, hasn't she? Oh my god! Yeah, it's been a thing. St- Stephen King retweets something not related to that specifically. She's like, "Oh my god!" As someone who grew up being an absolute fan of your work and inspiration, thank you so uh, much for like acknowledging my thing. She fanboyed out over Stephen King in a way where you like, if we weren't all hating you for being a turf right now, J.K., we'd probably all think this was adorable. And then someone said, "Wait, so do you support her views?" Stephen King. Stephen King goes, "Uh, what is it? Trans women, trans women, women." women. And J.K. Rowling deletes her praise tweet. Deletes the tweet he retweeted. And uh, unfollows him, and it's like, yeah. oh, oh so you definitely hate baby trans girl. people, don't you, JK? Yeah. Um, oh, 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 uh, go cry to your fucking millions, Joe. <laughs> you hateful, hateful woman. Do, do you remember um, that time we went? Do you remember that time we did a big shop in Asda and Trafford at like one in the morning? I think we've only ever done it maybe once together. Yeah, I don't recall. But it, that would be a weird fucking place to be recognised. Yeah, it was a woman by the milk who wouldn't leave me alone. Um, woman by the milk! Who got a photo ah! with me. Who got a photo with me. And then my uh, brother's uh, partner... It's a woman by the milk! My brother's partner asked me how I knew such and such a body a few days later. And I was like, I don't know who that is. They were like, you got a photo? There's a photo review with them. She pro- it's her profile picture. And it was like a friend of her mum's. It was like, that's just weird. That's just yeah. flipping weird. Oh, God. Um, I think that's probably the weirdest, just because it came out of nowhere. <laughs> it's like, yeah, what that the is hell? fucking weird. Because um, normally, normally it'd be a kid coming over and a parent being very apologetic, or a parent coming over with a kid being like they're too shy, but they just wanted to ask if they could like get a photo. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So it's yeah, just yeah. a random woman in the thing. It's like, oh Jesus. Although <laughs> I, did, I did get recognised briefly, um, in the queue for. Oh Christ! What's it called? Who's the Mounty character? The cartoon character is a Mount Dudley Do Right. The queue for Dudley Do Right's Ripsaw <laughs> Falls in Florida in 2012. Sure. I I had a kid stare at me, looking bamboozled, and then his his dad and him were a few places in front of us. And Why as is they, this? As dad? they turn around one corner to go further into the queue, it was like, no, but Dad, it was him. It was him. I was just like, oh God, please don't turn into an awkward conversation. This queue's 40 minutes long. <laughs> I just want to go down a long flume and get it's not, drenched. It's not the kind of place you want to be recognised in the queue for a ride, is it? Like No, because oh. based on it, nine times out of ten, you meet people and they're perfectly pleasant and lovely. And it's like, oh, yeah, no, thanks very much. This other, blah, blah. And you respect the personal boundaries and acknowledging you as a human being. Sometimes it's that awkward, like, yeah. It's like, right, well, I better be off my way. All right, yeah. So uh, uh, so uh, more questions. You're like, not now. Seriously, I'm having a piss. Go away. Yeah. Um, See, why, why did you get into the cubicle? Um... <laughs> All right, so the face just under the wall. We're opening Hi. a rest. We're, o- we're opening a, a restaurant with the five Who fans. We're in a pandemic. The, it'll never the work. The most recent lineup. Uh, what do we call it, and who does what? Um. Uh. Oh. Um. We call it <laughs> my boy and sons. <laughs> uh. <laughs> my boy and sons. Um. And uh. So, so uh, what was what, the question? Is like, what's everyone's, what, what's what everyone's what? role? Oh, um, I'm not sure what the rest of us do. I think the rest of us faff around in the kitchen and try and make it work. I mean, let's let's face it. You you would run the bar because you nope. know your way around drinks. And no, nope. no, but you no, but you own this place. You uh, own it, trolls. so trolls. you can kick people out. You're not working for anyone else. You can take Great. no shit and kick people yeah. out. Um, and you can drink all you want on the job because you own it and it's your place and you've got the keys. Ah. Um, but and I don't know my way around mixing anything for the fucking life of me. But <laughs> if if John was on the bar, he'd just be giving giving everyone fruity cider. That'd be it. So you yeah, need to fair. be there. You have a knowledge fair, fair. of drinks. You have to be there. Yeah. But fair. I know this. Phoenix would just be the uh, the <laughs> would be the slam poetry night guy who comes <laughs> in twice a week. <laughs> And <laughs> does some slam poetry. Phoenix would be the guy who comes in to do the pull quiz on Thursdays. Um, <laughs> and also it's where he tries out some of his stand-up material. Uh, <laughs> I would call... I would open... Uh, 
I go <laughs> hike. <laughs> hike. I would open a uh, restaurant called Five Chew Fans. Oh, oh, um, <laughs> and it would be themed around food. You have to chew for a long time. <laughs> so just everything's be... overcooked and or undercooked. rubbery. <laughs> oh, right, it's just like overcooked braising steak. Yeah. Um, celery. Yeah. A shitload of celery. Uh, pasta that's not quite soft enough yet. Yeah, yeah. Like al dente, but so, but, like super al dente pasta. Yeah, but but uh, but, it, but it, it's it's just soft enough that you convince yourself. Oh, if I'll just mix it in with the sauce. I'll. It'd be fine. Mm. And you know, it's, 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 and we don't serve anything but small glasses of water during the meal. Yeah. We mark it so, as uh Oh. As oh. a work a workout for your mouth. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, uh John would handle decor and front of house. Um, yes, to be fair, yeah, yeah, him and, okay, yeah, that makes Dan, sense. Dan would be our head waiter. Uh, Dan would be a great head waiter. He'd be yeah, scary and snooty. You see. You see. Um... <laughs> and he'd come into the kitchen after dealing with a particularly shitty customer and be like, I don't believe... Just, oh, table four. Oh, well, oh, oh, Phoenix... Dan, I'm going to clip his ears. <laughs> Phoenix and Billy would be our chefs. Just... <laughs> like, and also just like creatively naming things in silly ways thinking up the weirdest combinations and just sort of egging each other on to new levels of fucking silliness. Um, you would just lord it over everyone and stroke all the money we make in the uh, in the office. So I'd, the burn it down for the insurance. <laughs> I'd burn it down I'd burn it down for the insurance money. Uh, Excellent. Excellent. That's what I'd do. Uh, With the so, booze that you've trailed out the building. Yeah, yeah. There Sorry. you go. I'm not doing this. Uh, two more emails, <laughs> fairly lengthy ones, but we've started, so we might as well fucking finish. Hit um, me, Humphreys. <laughs> but also give us your wage, because like you're grossly overpaid. <clears throat> Christopher, Mattstaffer, this is an email <laughs> from. <laughs> Tom <gasps> Monty. The peoples of the village said he were dead. No, they called him a myth. It is said that five generation, four score year and twain, Tom Monty had drifted into the mists of the lock. But no, Tom, he hath risen. <laughs> Tom Monty say. The man called Tom Monty say yes. There it is. Uh, there it is. <laughs> the man called Tom Monty, he say yes. Anyone who doesn't have a knowledge of uh, 90s British adverts for fruit juice has no idea what the fuck we're talking about. <laughs> Catch um, up, folks. <laughs> dear Chris and Matt, I don't think I've written in since lockdown began. Staying inside all day has kept me very busy. But please don't think I haven't been quietly enjoying your output. Since the start of lockdown, I've rewatched Breaking Bad for the first time in three years, and Thank it's you. reaffirmed my feelings towards it as the greatest to the show of all Tim. <laughs> Especially considering we've had Game of Thrones, Season 7, and 8 in the space of those three years, which have massively tarnished my feelings towards that show as a whole. <laughs> I think I remember at least one of you saying you've watched it, and that you viewed it in a positive light. What are your thoughts on Breaking Bad? When was the last time you watched it? Have you even watched the spin-off series, Better Call Saul? I thoroughly enjoyed season five. I have also 
finally started watching classic Doctor Who on Britbox after many failed attempts in the past. I thought you were going to say Betamax. But I... <laughs> <laughs> Betamax was a failed attempt in the past. Um, <laughs> but I am once again struggling to get through the Hartnell era. I've got to the Dalek invasion of Earth, where the Doctor threatens to give Susan a jolly good, jolly good smacked, smacked bottom. bottom. Lol. But it's ah. extremely dated, and each serial is a chore to watch, especially when there's more than four parts to a serial. The only bits I enjoy at the moment is when the Doctor is on screen. I think my problem might be that I've tried to watch all of it in order, and I've seen people on Reddit saying it might be worth skipping the Hartnell and Troughton era to when it becomes less incredibly dated. Have you any advice on how to tackle classic who? How did you watch it for the first time, and would you say it starts getting more watchable? And what are your thoughts on the Hartnell era? Are there any episodes <laughs> post Dalek Invasion that I should look forward to? Congratulations on surpassing four years, blimey, of the big damn cast. I very much enjoyed your drunk special. Yours, Tom Monte. Yes, Chris, first July, five Who fans returning. This is in the future for me at the time of writing, but whatever it is, I think it's gonna be whopper. Well, of course, we now know that uh, that five Who fans announcement was the return of Aimless Wanderings. Um, and thank you very much on your congratulations for our four year damn anniversary. I'm using that now, Dan. Um, of the big damn cast, and I'm oh, glad you enjoyed God. our drunk special. I enjoyed making it uh and taking an extra day in production um, to edit it <laughs> yeah because yeah. uh, we needed it <laughs> so breaking bad have you seen breaking bad i have i've seen breaking bad do you yes. like breaking bad i liked it i it's one of those things where like everyone says it's the greatest piece it's one of the greatest pieces of tv ever made so i like you when it comes to some things like that when you keep hearing it you go all right yeah. and then you take forever to get around to it but when i did i watched it and it's probably one of the most solid like stories ever told. Yeah, it's just a really good piece of TV. Um, yeah, really it's phenomenal performance, yeah. uncomfortable, scary, heartfelt, and often uh, intimidating. Like uh, writing dialogue scenarios, relationships, um, people doing contradictory things that people would do because they're people. And a great and not journey just perfect, of perfect, like yeah. ciphers for the story that someone wants to tell, and then the rock subplot, um, with bloody minerals. But uh, it's it's one of those where it's like <laughs> minerals. You... <laughs> oh, Hank! It's great because like Hank sort of oh. gets less interesting during that because they stretch that sort of period out a little bit in a way that's yeah. sort of like where are they going with this? But then as soon as he's back on his feet, they make the fucking most of him being no, back in it boy do they oh my god it's um, yeah it's yeah. five really succinct well-paced series they had yeah. a plan going in they knew what they were going to do and how they were going to tell it they adjusted it slightly as they went to make a room for a little bit more and and it's it's so good and again a series that unashamedly is like yeah we want you to like this guy yeah and in yeah. five seasons we want you to hate this guy. Yeah. <laughs> but you uh, no, won't thought, be able to look away. <laughs> I thought it was really good. And, and Keats watched it recently uh, for the first time. So I rewatched some of it with her. And uh, yeah, holds up. It's good stuff, man. Some of the best um, villains in recent TV as well. Did you watch El Camino? I've not seen El Camino. No. It's good, man. It's I, good. I, kind of, I kind of felt like recapping season five before I watched mm. it just because it's been a few years. But It's a nice yeah. little cap, but I think it also does a good job of like reminding you what happened. Um, oh, fair enough. I might dip in then this week. Uh, have you watched the spin? I've not watched any Better Call Saul. Mm, I hear it's great. Same. I just haven't got around to it. I'm amazed it's into five seasons. My God. Yeah, so it's as long as the original show. Soon, like, Because it's going to get to the point where um, Saul Goodman is going to look 
way older <laughs> than he does in the second season of Breaking oh. Bad when he first rocked up. <laughs> More like Bob Oldenkirk. <laughs> <laughs> he does wear a wig for that show. Um, so All yeah. right, so classic <laughs> Who. How did you watch it for the first? Well, I've still not watched a lot of classic Who. Like I only have watched the stuff that I managed to acquire on DVD and VHS. So there's huge gaps in my classic Who knowledge. Um, um, well, and- Lucy and myself have been doing the, the marathon for yeah. Just over two years now, we've been marathoning the show from the beginning in terms of everything that is available on BBC DVD. Annoyingly, a couple of Troutons have been re- have been animated and reconstructed since, but we're going to like go back to them as we go and and yeah. like you know do like a special bonus video on. So how did uh, how did the faceless ones turn out? You know how did Fury from the Deep turn out? Um, how did the the, the Macro Terra turn out? So uh, we'll do that later, but. Yeah, I now having watched it chronologically, solidly, bar the missing ones, from an unearthly child to as of yesterday, Ark of Infinity. Um, it's a good I love, I love it. I recommend watching as much of it as you can. But at the same time, considering the the wealth and breadth of it, Tom, I would say <laughs> don't don't be shy. If it's your first time going in, don't be shy to just dip into each era and watch like two stories from each doctor's yeah. era and just get just just give it a try see what see what you like um hartnell are there better stories after dalek invasion of earth yeah the romans uh, the, the rescue and the romans immediately afterwards yeah, are an good. absolute um, fucking delight uh vicky's then, such a, a then the web planet energy. happens and it's terrible web planet's awful um the chase is balls the, the chase, chase is really bad the chase is balls but it's got like really good bits in it like memorable no no, no, no it no, no. hasn't no, no 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 we've said this before good is good bad is good boring is bad like the bad in I, this I is entertaining chase, as hell yeah but i think it's more boring than than entertaining um, how dare you i'm gonna send a mechanoid to loosely tackle you with its little oh, little metal oh, rods no. that do this a little bit at the front like that oh oh um, no not the mechanoids if you want oh dear time if, metal is great <clears throat> time oh the time medal so is so good you're in you're out yeah good fun stuff the time medal um, is excellent the war machines is really bloody good is it um yes yes okay. it is <laughs> i like the arc as well i suppose the war machines is the proper like first contemporary story yeah it's the first one set in doctor who set uh, uh properly on present day earth yeah um and uh, it's also, just for trivia's sake, worth watching because it's the only time he's referred to as Doctor Who. Yeah. Um, by a required. character. Um, yeah, Doctor Who is required because the writers and the production team at this point had changed just enough that no one was really monitoring this yeah. shit. But um, it's um, it's worth it. Uh, I think I think War Machines the tenth is actually planets decent, good. It's a sort of very proto... Um, War Machines is, is very an, an almost embryonic unit set up. Yeah. Like in a way that yes, would be built on is. with the invasion. Web of Fear. And Web of Fear. On yeah. with the invasion. And then eventually give us Spearhead from Space. Where I'd argue is where Classic Who gets more watchable. More accessible. For, more, for yeah, mod, more for accessibly mod watchable. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's, when it, um, it's when it goes to colour. And when mm-hmm. it. Although that first season is a bit weird in that it does have the problem of earlier seasons in that it's made up of three stories which are all too fucking long. Yeah. Because there, there's three seven episode stories in that after Spearhead. Yeah. Um, and that is a big, that's the, that's the biggest problem I think with, with the Hartnell and Troughton errors. It's not, it's not the black and white. It's not the set design. It's the fact that it's written for like six episode stories so often. I mean, or more, d- which are t- which just, yeah, go for, they just drag. Tom, some of that might help you. Have you tried breaking it up into like one episode a night? Because I mean, obviously, it was meant yeah. to be consumed initially as one a week, and and like some stories drag in in a like there is a there is a persistent problem through a lot of the classic era of stories just based on how we how we deal with like TV and entertainment now and how we process it and and how yeah. pace has changed over the years. Some stories feel like you could clip an entire episode out and it would improve it immediately. Like, I I really like the invasion and the war games, but trying to watch either one of those in one sitting is gonna it's gonna kill you. Well, the war games is the the longest 
one, isn't it? It's ten, ten episodes. episodes. Yeah. Um, it's so, ten. I think it's ten really good episodes. Mm. But it's fucking long, and you don't want to watch it in one sitting. It's eight really tense, really um, yeah. thrilling episodes, and then two really. Oh, the shits hit the fan now. Because yeah. the, my... the war games pretty much wraps up at the end of episode eight. Yeah, and then nine is sort of like the 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 transition, and ten is the welcome to the first ever Time Lord appearance, and aren't yeah. they terrifying? And it's like, oh my god! Um, basically, Tom, but if you don't my, if you don't yeah. want to absorb, uh, watch the rescue, watch the Romans, watch the Time Meddler, um, watch the War Machines if you're up for something a little longer. Watch the Tenth Planet; it's pretty fun. You get to see a classic monster's first appearance. Uh, if they have some of the partially animated or, or reconstructed or found ones on there, give uh, give uh, Power of the Daleks a watch. Yeah, Trouton. I love Power of the Daleks. Watch the Tomb of the Cybermen. Yep. Um, if if they've got it on there, watch Web of Fear. Watch the Crotons. No. <laughs> watch Watch the Invasion. Um, and then just start with John and see how you feel. John's first yeah. series, like Matt says. It's it's lots of long stories except the first one, but worth it. And then the yeah. next series is where a lot of the elements you'll recognize start to really play a part in yeah. the show. Yeah, yeah. So um, um, yeah, stick the with it. Downside of the stick with the, it. Also, starting off with Pertwee mm-hmm. kind of eases you into some of the more sci-fi aspects because he, he's on Earth for most of the first two seasons. It's only it, after it, that that he starts it becomes being... Quatermass. It, oh, stops being, then, it stops being it stops being the magic actually... school bus and it becomes Quatermass. <laughs> It's the first. His first four seasons. He's on. He's on it. From he's on. He's earthbound for most of it. Yeah. His, his first. His first three, because the Time Lords send him on some missions in in his second. Oh, like yeah, send him on yeah. one mission in his second, and then uh, send him on a couple in his third, and then his fourth series is just like, well, I thought it. I'm going to bugger off now. Come along, Thunder Chain. Oh, hello. It's nice to meet you. Let's go find some time. Ah, the dinosaurs. Ah, look at Thunder Chain. Um. Yeah. So. Yes, I love yeah. it. Yeah, no but way. Yeah, that, that's the thing about Classic Who. It, Suck it and see. It's not, it's not meant to be marathoned, even though the short episodes, because it's serialised. Um, so if you find it hard to do that, that, don't worry about it. And also, you don't have to watch it. And it, even less, you don't have to watch it all. If you don't like it, if there's nothing wrong with not liking Classic Who and still being a Who fan, despite what some Doctor Who fans will tell you. Like, yeah. it's... It's old TV. It's not for everyone. And there are some things that people really like about the show that weren't really front and center until the revival. So you don't, you don't, you don't have to prove anything to anyone. Um, although but if, if you, you don't are, report back to us, you know we will. Yeah, we will hurt. Also, you, you know, it, if you want to d- discover it, discover it. But don't feel a obligation to watch it all out of a sense of completion. You ain't got anything to prove to anyone. Um, Last one comes in from Simon. Um, Simon! He is uh, mentioning... Uh, picking up on something that he mentioned on stream. Ah, uh, uh, yes. For those who don't know, uh, twitch.tv so slash bigdamnstream every Monday and Friday night. Matt and sometimes myself will appear and stream games at the moment. Matt's yes. playing The Last of Us Part 1 because we all need to feel slightly frightened of the germs outside that can kill us. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> um, he says, Good day to the fine and entertaining beings known as Matt and Chris. Good day to so, you. I don't think he's addressed this to the right people. <laughs> I hope today and this week have been finding you and your important people in your lives well. Hopefully with the news of Michael Keaton returning as Batman and various other positive gems of geeky gossip and nerdy news. Slowly diminishing all, diminishing all the bad, but we'll still remember the important messages and what they stand for. Pride, Black lives matter, uh, trans lives matter, and pride lives matter. No one can be victimized for what race or orientation or decision they're going to decide to make. In the end, we're all human and uh, need to get along. Well, that's not the fucking truth. Um, takes a deep breath. Sorry about that. Uh, what was I going to talk about? Oh, yes, TV transfers. You talked briefly about Buffet. Has it transferred from the 1992 film with Christy Swanson to the, the popular Sarah Michelle Gellar series in 1997. But what do you know and can you tell us about other TV series that started out as films? Well, first off, not a huge amount, hmm. but you've given us some examples to get kicked off. So let's have a look around this list and say... And say and give some short thoughts on them. Um, Shorts. So there was a Bill and Ted cartoon series and a live action series. Yeah, I remember these. 
There was I've a, seen a little bit of the cartoon series, but I don't really remember it, and I never saw the live action one. Yeah, the the, the cartoon one's distinct because Keanu Reeves and Alex Winter reprised their roles for it. Yeah, yeah. And it ran for two seasons, and it was basically a wacky educational cartoon. Yeah. And then it's like Saban or Bandai, like. Did, oh, did yeah. a live action show and like a lot so of their did projects, loads of weird live action stuff, didn't they? Like a lot of their nineties ones, it ran for one season. The whole thing mm. didn't air; it aired like four or five episodes, and then and then it got cancelled. So they like block ran the bunch of them on a day, and then I think it got like a VHS release of some of the episodes. Um, yeah, yeah, it just you know uh, an odd one. I think you could absolutely spin Bill and Ted off, spin Bill and Ted off into a TV show. But I just yeah. don't know. If, I don't know if they did it right. I think it's also because um, it came out at the same time. The, t- the cartoon came out within the same couple of years as the Back to the Future animated series. Well, which is the next one on the list. Ah, well, there you um, go. Well, they both have the uh, same premise, basically. Yeah, I remember that one being fine. Yeah, like, yeah. I mean, it was about the the weird, creepy kids of Doc Brown, who yeah. famous famously, there's that one kid at the end of number three who's just pointing at his dick and staring at something past the camera in the back of the shot. <laughs> It's really weird. Once you notice it, you can't unsee it. It's horrifying. He's got this murderous glare and he's pointing at his dick. It's weird. It's weird. Maybe Christopher Lloyd's in the foreground being um, like, the future is what you make it, Marty. Oh, goodbye. It's all sentimental. This kid just going, look at my pants. It's weird. It's weird. And um, they left that cut in the film. <laughs> you've talked about how there is enjoyment in Aladdin the Animated Series before, haven't you? Oh, God, yeah. Matt, one of the um, villains is called Abyss Maul. <laughs> Abyss Maul. That's the punnage you're in for with Aladdin the Animated Series. Yeah. I, it's pretty I, great. I, Mechanicles. That's a villain. I remember that's, Mechanicles. That's it was a clockwork man. I have fondish um, memories yeah. of, of, of Aladdin. Um, and it crossed, over with, it crossed over with the Hercules Animated Series. Yes, which I also have... I think I was. I think I aged out of it by the time Hercules came along. Yeah, they did a few of those, didn't they? They did. They did a couple of. You were. You were watching. You watched. Of... You watched digging it. You didn't get around to dig it. <laughs> basically. Yeah, I think yeah. so. Um, <laughs> Hercules breaks the canon of the film by having a story set in like his teen years. Yeah, where he's, where he's going to basically Greek high school, and Hades knows he's alive, which completely ruins the plot of the movie because mm. Hades believes Herc to be dead as a baby. Mm. And that's why it's a surprise when the stars are aligning 80 years later. It's like, wait, he's alive? What? Well, of course what? he's alive, Hades. You had like three seasons of animated adventures with him on Disney Channel in the mornings. Hey, listen. <laughs> Hades did a lot of drugs. Um, <laughs> James uh, Woods, big Coca-Cola co- fan. Hmm. Indeed. There was a Beetlejuice series with, with its weird art style. Yeah, yeah, I do um, remember that one fondly. I, again, I remember seeing a couple of those, and it was all right. Honey, I shouldn't the kids the series. I've never seen this. I'm a, I'm aware of it, but I've never seen it. Live action show, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I recall With, that. Um, yeah, Peter, somebody doing the Rick Moranis role. Yeah, again, it was part of that weird, that weird era in the '90s where like American networks were like, "Oh, we've got to turn that into a show," and it just sort of doesn't quite. They all seem to be based around sci-fi comedies. They did a Tremors one. I remember that. They did a Tremors I wa- TV show. I never show. watched I've any, never but I remember, I remember finding never that out it. one day and being like, wait, what? You're the I've Tremors seen... guy. <laughs> hey, I've only ever seen the first one. I've purposefully not gone after any of the sequels or spin-offs. I've just not. Because the first <laughs> the one decision. is almost perfect. Yeah, it's pretty good. Pretty good. Well, maybe maybe that's a future project. Is the is the Tremors expanded universe? Um, because yeah. um, another one was is uh, you remember you remember the nineteen nineties the Adams family. Yeah, yeah, that was the and, the, and, the then, and then pilot no, for got, which what? we got the Adams family and the Adams family values. Uh, it was the Adam Adams family reunion, which was reunion. the backdoor pilot for the TV show. Yeah. Uh, although a lot yeah. of the actors who were in the reunion didn't go into the live action no. show which i think was called the new adams family i think um, so and it's, i never yeah, saw any of it it's an oddity because like it obviously marketed itself if you're in the uk you didn't see adams family reunion go out on tv you just saw the vhs on sale like in the chart one week in like mm. the late 90s and you were like oh right a new one because it looks like it's the follow-up to to values it isn't it's no. not 
and it's like it's it just suddenly it feels like you've watched the broadway production of something and now you're watching like the local community theater directed by the guy who's playing all the parts like version yeah. it it just looks so so cheap uh, and again i think it was a bandai a uh, saban kind of joint that sounds bad oh right. my god they did it <gasps> they did casper ones in the 90s as well uh a spirited beginning was the one of them. Spectacular New Adventures of Casper. Yeah, Casper and Wendy which was, was another one. Which was a one. spin-off. It was a oh spin-off of God. the 1995 live action film. Yeah, yeah, the the the, the sequel to the live action film was a prequel called The Spirited Beginning and it's bad. Oh. Like, it is but it's I, I think the only way to describe it is like the, the the late 90s Saban Bandai kind of projects on TV all have the same feel of just like, oh, just feel a bit icky and a bit weird. And yeah, that be- fucking Teenage it's- Mutant Ninja Turtles one is bad. Well, it, oh God, your next, uh, next mutation, but it's oh, it's best personified by Beetleborgs. Like Beetleborgs is the sort of, yeah, the, yeah. this is the first 100% American with a bit of Japanese footage in it. No, Here's no. what it is. Oh, oh no, no. All, oh. The, all the stuff in suits and vehicles is Japanese, like ah. Power Rangers. God, it's only it's out. only the stuff with the kids and the weird haunted house that's, that's know, American. Do you know what made me think it wasn't? Because it actually looks like it was filmed the same year. I, I just assumed yeah, that it was shot more, at the same time. There's less <laughs> of a gap between that and the Japanese footage, but it's still ah. it's, it's still from a Sentai show, yeah. yeah so yeah, yeah. You, you so you know that weird forced wackiness of of the all the wraparound stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the vibe that pretty much all of these projects had. It's it's really odd. You know you know like. The way that Bulk and Skull balanced it okay in Mighty Morphin, yeah, and then yeah, every yeah. series after it was just like, what is this? Like weird. Well, Mighty Morphin was just starting from a goofier place, I think. Oh, um, yeah. oh god! But then, yeah. but they're they badass teens the... with attitude, but they're also helping out at that youth center because they're good role models. <laughs> um, <laughs> it was there was both live action and animated RoboCop series. Oh <gasps> yes, I seen Jesus. a bit of the live action one. It's yeah. not good. It's not well, good. Well, Robocop um, three, Robocop three is basically the pilot for it, isn't it? In a way, yeah, yeah. It's like, can Robocop be that PG? Was... Yes, it can. No one liked it, but we did no. it. Make a can show. It PG, can it be PG and good? <laughs> Apparently not. No. Yeah. Oh God! Wow. Yeah. I Listen about that. There are three kinds of service. There's PG, good, and Robocop. <laughs> you can only have two. <laughs> You'd have good Robocop, but it can't be PG. You can have PG Robocop, but it can't be good. Sir, what about PG good? Get out! <laughs> can't, it can't be Robocop! <laughs> That's true. Um, Even PG good isn't Robocop, so it's still breaking the formula. Y- oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, there was the Mask and Ace Ventura animated series. Is, is... The Ace Ventura one was weird. but We talked really... about these before, I think. Yeah, it had a really fun point and click PC game. Oh, it was God. like you, you know those PC games from the mid to late nineties, things like the Winnie the Witch adaptation and things like that, where it was yeah. just click on. You basically just went into the locations from the tunes or the books, and you just clicked on shit, and it was interactive. Yeah. Okay. And it was as as a five year old, you're like, this is the greatest thing I will ever play. Meanwhile, somewhere in your future, like Horizon Zero Dawn is going. We'll see. <laughs> you know I mean, like something in the future is going. You fucking wait. Like yeah. you think this is gaming. I'll see you in 20 years. But, um, you know, uh, Ace Ventura had one like that that was kind of fun. I will I will fight and die on the hill of Mask, the Mask the Animated Series. It's great. Yeah, Simon has, has labelled it as your favourite on this list. Oh, God, I've probably talked about it before. No, uh, it is. We have talked about it before, yeah. yeah. It is, it is um, solid. It is so good. Because it's a superhero show where your superhero is an obnoxious prick. Like, yeah. uh, and it's it's great. Oh, yeah, really um, do you know, I've just realised what a really common thread for a lot of these is. Tim Curry. I mean, Tim, oh, yeah. He's All in right. a shitload of them. He's in the Master of right. series. He's the main villain. Pretorius. <laughs> who, who's a cyborg, like, scientist guy, and his head pops off his shoulders and sprouts the old metallic spider legs before Mr. Oh. Freeze was doing it. So. Oh. Yeah, um, there you go. <laughs> We have talked, of course, at length about the real Ghostbusters and Extreme <gasps> Ghostbusters back in the early, early days of the podcast. By like episode three, my man. Yeah. yeah, no, I, yeah. I, love, so, I love them both. Very I good. I love them both. You I know, have a special place in my heart for Extreme Ghostbusters. You know, there was an Aliens animated series in development at one point. 
oh, tie development. in with the toy line. With the toys, with the animal like there's hybrids a, there's and stuff. Rumours that there's a pilot floating around out there, but it's never been found. Mm, I can imagine. There's can imagine. key art from it because that was used to make the toys. <clears throat> that makes sense. But it was never produced. Um, it was Kenner, so right? that, w- that was nearly a thing. Yeah, yeah. Kenner yeah. did it. Kenner did uh, it. <laughs> Palpatine's behind it all. And they did it bad. Um, oh, droid, droids and Ewoks. Droids and droids. That was actually a show. Um, droids. Not a, huge fan. not a huge fan of them. It's but not good. They're, they're kitsch. They're it's kitsch. fucking bad. <laughs> it's actually um, bad. But of course we got The Clone Wars. Yeah, Clone yeah. Wars. Rebels and uh, I've not watched any of Resistance. I've but, not watched um, any Resistance. Looks nice. I like the cell shaded animation style. I think it's kind of pretty. Yeah, I think the animation, the animation on the on all the sort of Dave Filoni produced stuff is is really good. Uh, I'm in CG. season. I'm, I'm in season two of Clone Wars now. My actual start watching from the beginning marathon. Yeah, it's like it, it gets one, really good in se- series one. is just kind of standalone episodes of just yeah, here's yeah. some fighting, here's some conflict. Well, I think, buy our I think toys, it was like here we produced go. in one order and then aired and released in a different order. So it, I don't think yeah. it flows quite right from what I've even, heard. Even on Disney but, Plus. Disney Plus cocks yeah. up a lot like that. I've been watching DuckTales twenty seventeen and like every other episode they refer to events that haven't happened. Then you'll watch the next one you'll be like, hang on, this was that oh, thing good. they were talking good. about. Yeah. Oh my God. But um, um but series two is great. Like conspir- political conspiracies and stuff start to come up, and it's like this works well. This is really good. I really need Palpatine to watch looks more. terrifying, and that's just when he's looking nice. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> um, the well, separatists have attacked the rebel colony of the Galactic Republic. There's a lot we've touched on. We've touched on some of them, but I'm gonna I'm gonna call it there. We might come back to that topic in oh, future because it's oh, interesting stuff. I'll, I'll, we'll, come, we'll definitely come back to it. Mind? Uh, uh, Starship Troopers, the CGI animated series. Yeah, yeah, yes. that was weird because in the UK it was shown on Sky at like seven fifteen in the morning. Yeah, even though even though it was about bug monsters being ripped to pieces. Um. That was an early CG show as well, wasn't it? Or early-ish. Yeah. And it, didn't, Beast Wars. And it didn't look too terrible. Yeah. It didn't look too terrible. It was one of the first ones that kind of had a darker colour palette, which saved how it looked. Mm. Um, Godzilla, the animated series, spun out of the night. Oh, that Godzilla was film. really good. I need to try and get hold of that, man. I'd love to watch that. That way. was fantastic, because it was, yeah. their, it, was, it was their way of going. There were people who worked on that Godzilla movie who, honestly, we do like Godzilla. We're yeah. sorry for that thing you just watched. So we're going to try and work the mythology in. Um, yeah. And it's like th- their version of Mecha, because Godzilla in the show is the baby that hatches at the end of the film. Yeah. And in season two, maybe, they do Mecha Godzilla, which is like the evil corporation, because of course there's an evil corporation, yeah. uh, uh, bring the corpse of Godzilla, so the yeah. mother, back to life with cybernetics. And that's their version of Mecha Godzilla. It's like, well, that's cool. Um, and it's definitely even, superior to the film because the Matthew Broderick character isn't played by Matthew Broderick. Well, he's th- their Nick Totopoulos is part of another trend because another another series from not too long after that was uh, Evolution. I didn't catch the Evolution one. Pretty great, and again a Monster of the Week kind of format. Yeah. Um, uh, and 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 it was about like the grotesque visuals. There was a lot. Actually, there was a lot of that. In the, Go- Godzilla. Evolution, um, who both have, for some reason, they take their protagonists, in, in this case, these movies, Matthew Broderick and David Duchovny, and their cartoon versions are, like, weirdly hunkier and more action hero-y. And it's really kind of like, what? what? Wait, it's the same character. Why don't you make it a new character? But yeah. whatever. Um, those shows had this, like, grotesque monstery art style. So did Extreme Ghostbusters. The ghosts in that are, like, terrifying. So did Men in Black, Men in Black. the animated series, which is fucking great. And you can't get it anywhere. You you can like see some episodes in decent quality on YouTube. Yeah. Men in Black the animated series was brilliant. It was so so good. Um and you're already picturing that weird animation of the silhouettes walking down the corridor and it all just looking kind yeah. of stylized and freaky. And the yeah. aliens on the lineup doing the dude dude step to the left, step to the right, and then that just before the photos of the lineup's taken, the last one goes to the beat of the music where it goes it just sort of goes, Where hey in the lineup. It, oh, it's great. It's great. Oh, it's good grotesque. Time. Oh 
There was some good stuff there. And Vincent D'Onofrio plays Edgar in it. Does he? Because it's a non-canon sequel to the first film, the series. Like, it's that whole thing of... The first film happened, but not exactly how you remember it. And there's even an episode about a movie adaptation of this alleged event at the Roswell uh, the, the Roswell display. At the science fair and, and will smith and tommy lee jones are playing the agents in it so they kind of allude to it but edgar appears in i think two stories and d'onofrio reprised the role and it's like oh my god this is great he's up for a laugh in he d'onofrio <laughs> oh, yeah. um yeah that's what he would have said were he here and alive and an alien in an there edgar is- suit there is more to that to, to simon's <laughs> email of more more on that titanic list and also things that have made you jump the other way back around. But that might be something we come back to in the future because we're running over two hours here and it's late. And I have yeah. neighbors. Um, yeah, we're sodgy neighbors. Uh, sodgy neighbors. We come back to. Sodgy neighbors. Um, get him in. Get him in as guests for the next episode. I've still got to fucking edit this thing yet. Oh, you don't need um, sleep or food. It's fine. Yeah, I don't, I suppose. <laughs> uh, um, right. So that's been a show. That's been a show. This was Thanks a show. Emails, folks. Thanks for everyone who emailed in. <laughs> Thanks for everyone who listened. Thanks for everyone who's looking after each other out there. Um, washing their hands and, and wearing masks. Yeah. Being good to each other and uh, protecting each other. Be um, be excellent to each other. Yeah. He says you, with one hand outstretched and another on his chest. Yeah. Be excellent I, to I, each I other. Mirror, I mirror you and do the same. <laughs> um, yeah. You know where you can find us. Follow In us at Big Cast on Twitter for all the announcements. That's Come it. back here next week for more of this. Twitch.tv forward slash a big damn cast for streams and a uh, big damn stream. Sorry, not big damn cast for casts. Big damn stream uh, for casts. Um, but, big damn contact at gmail.com. Yeah. Big damn channel on YouTube. Yeah. Behind hey, you at night while you sleep. Chris, I'm really glad we didn't get on Mixer. Oh. We can mix this closed now. They shut mix- Microsoft shut Mixer down. Oh, yes. Out of nowhere. That's true. Yeah, meaning that uh, yeah. some of the big streamers they coaxed over have to have to be given a giant buyout. They, they shut Mixer down out of nowhere, so out of nowhere that the people who were make a at living Mixer on it didn't know yeah. it was closing. Yeah, so thank God we didn't jump on the Mixer train. But you can find us at all the other places we mentioned. <laughs> and uh, till the next we meet, we're gonna go watch a bunch of Men in Black the animated series on YouTube. Oh, it's weird. Fun. It's 4-3, and in the bottom left corner of the screen to avoid copyright. I'm going to try and find some Godzilla right now. Oh, baby. Oh, baby, I love you. Squeonk. Um, <laughs> bye, everyone.